I like that's that. That's the makeup. first thing we, I want to We are say. live on YouTube now. So okay. I you got guys you. can talk about your Pantene hair <laughs> style. Yeah, you're between a year between haircuts doesn't look good. Yeah, you, you can edit that out, Tom. Yeah, here, here, this will help. Okay. There you go. Oh, no, it doesn't help. Okay. <laughs> Let the flocks flow. It doesn't help. There. I love it. Love it. Give me one minute here to get this thing set up. So should we be opening up PowerPoint while we're talking, uh, Kevin, or what? No, sir. You're, uh, I'm going to go pretty quickly and just kind of show you all the different features um, and then just kind of let you brainstorm in terms of some ideas and different ways you can use it because we're going to touch on the, the Visio aspect of things and how that works and, and kind of show you what some of the NFL teams are doing and how they're using PQD to kind of expedite their workflow. Sounds good. <clears throat> Coach Brennan, good to see you on here, sir. Good to see you, Kevin. I, that thing is, uh, to me, that pro quick draw was, I redid everything. This, this, this year off is, was bad because we didn't get to coach football, but it was good because, you know, it just permitted you to, or, or anybody to just redraw and, and, and I wouldn't have had the time to do that in a season or whatnot, even in the off season to do but everything from A to Z has been redrawn. And now we even got, I got, even got the video stuff in there and all that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm fired up. This is the best thing that I've you know, invested in. I invested in, in the last couple of, couple of years, I guess. I love it. And we did not pay him to say any of that. <laughs> <laughs> You can pay me. You know, also, funny is, is uh, <laughs> one of the one of the my coaching buddies reached out to me. He goes, "Well, what do you know about it?" And I was like, "I haven't used it yet, but everybody I talk to loves it." So, and I was like, "I haven't heard anything bad." So, it'd be interesting to see if there's anybody that's run un, run into any obstacles with it. So, but with that intro, um, we can uh, we can kind of get rolling here a little bit. Uh, Rick, do you want to go ahead and do the intro? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, back again. Now we've turned the calendar into June and we're heading into the home stretch of uh, what we're running here on Wednesday night. So I uh, want to welcome everybody back and uh, Paul Charbonneau has lined up Kevin Reddy. We got a little bit of a technology night lined up and then we're going to finish things off with JP Aslin uh, taking us through some screen games. So that uh, sort of will be a little bit of X's and O's, but the first couple presenters, uh, Kevin Reddy and Gabe Robinson are going to talk about um, some PowerPoint presentation and Kevin's going to talk about uh, how to link it up to some other programs. So uh, Kevin, take it away. Absolutely. Thank you. And how much time do I have? I, I want to respect everybody's time on this. You got, you got an hour. Okay. Awesome. Outstanding. Let me go ahead and uh, share up here, but appreciate it, everybody. Thank you all so much for your time. Um, my name is Kevin Reddy. Like coach said, I've been with pro quick draw for two and a half years now. Um, I was a grad assistant down at Georgia tech for three on the defensive side. So I have a, a football background with this and, uh, and was approached to, to work with Andy Bischoff, who I don't know if any of you know, but he would spend some time in the CFL and uh, he's now the tight ends coach down at Houston, Texas. So this is a software that was built by coaches for coaches. Um, we're, we're really proud in terms of just, you know, being able to have that mindset. And even our developer is a guy that worked in the, in the NFL for a long time. So it's, it's run by folks who understand the problems that you guys are having. And that's how we try to approach things. But I'm going to take it through uh, Visio tonight. I'm going to look at a little bit of uh, PowerPoint. And then lastly, show you guys also a new conversion piece that we're taking Playmaker profiles and throwing them into a PowerPoint, either in a PQD template, a one-off PowerPoint, um, or you can throw them into your Pro Quick Draw library. And the biggest piece of understanding is that you can edit those drawings once you get them in here. But I'm going to open up my Visio screen and kind of start there and then transition into PowerPoint. So if you're not familiar with Microsoft Visio, it's actually an engineering and architectural drawing software that Microsoft came out with. And in the mid 2000s, it came into the hands of some football coaches, I guess, because it draws really good X's and O's. And it kind of just took off on its own. This is a, a very dominated software in terms of the NFL and college football here in the States. And uh, it's, it's definitely useful. 
it is a little bit complex at the beginning, uh, but that's, you know, you, you can definitely learn. And if you go to our website, which is proquickdraw.com, we've got four hours of teaching material within Microsoft Visio and PowerPoint. And it has nothing to do with ProQuickDraw. It's just trying to teach you the basics of drawing. And, you know, here's how you draw a circle. Here's how you draw a square. Here's arrows. Here's different tips and tricks that you're going to see me talk about tonight that you can learn from. And that's a free resource that we provide for coaches. So if you've got any old coaches or young coaches who are looking to get in the game and looking to learn how to draw football, send them our way. We, we would love to help out. But what PQD does is it allows you to create and turn on your toggle panel. And what that toggle panel does is on the right side of your screen, it's gonna take you into a world in which you can manage all of your drawings and have them separated out by one file and one drawing. What that means is if I go into my PowerPoint folder here, I can slide this down. But if I go into offense, personnel groups, and then when you extend personnel groups, is it by name or by number? So the way we organize things is it's one file, one drawing. Well, why do we do that? The reason is, is if I go into the run game folder, you may have, you know, 30 different concepts against so many different fronts that you have. Well, if that's in a PowerPoint deck, what are you having to do? You're having to slide your mouse and you're searching for those individual plays. But with us, it's one play, one file. So if I want to find a specific concept, so if I type in the word Patriot, it's going to pull up all the plays of Patriot that I have within my system. And then that's going to allow you to organize things even cleaner. Uh, Coach Van Dam down at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, he has utilized the past game drawings and he separates it out in terms of folder and different concepts. But the one piece that he has added is, is let's say that they were playing the Falcons in week one. He's going to put a parentheses ATL-1 and close it. So now if coach comes back and goes, hey, I want you to pull up all the drive concepts that we ran against Atlanta in week one, he's able to do that very quickly and navigate and search all those files and folders. So it, it granted, I'll be the first to tell you, it is overwhelming because you're like, man, I've got years and years of playbook drawings. How do I organize that and bring it in? And the nice piece is that we give you a free 30-day trial. And in terms of that trial, you're going to get a blank folder structure. And I'll get into showing you how to get into that and build it out. But we're going to give you the keys to your playbook kingdom in terms of just starting from scratch. But in terms of how it works, I'm going to go up here to the top left-hand corner, and this is going to be our select template button. We're going to give you 38 or 40 something Visio templates, and we're going to give you twice of that in terms of PowerPoint. And it's presentation material, it's scout cards, it's 16 ups that you can use for walkthroughs, two ups, four ups, six ups, whatever. The great part too is you do not have to use our templates. You can even take these templates and customize them on your own. So if I open up a six up, well, this is the, the PQD six up. If you were at a particular team and you had your own set of templates, well, I can drop in and choose the Detroit Lions here. And if I choose my drop down and I wanted to utilize the lion six up every time, well, here's your concept. And then up here, you just change the word of the name drive and you're up and running and you're dropping in those folders. So customization is a huge key part of what we do. So I'm gonna go back into my, my PQD templates and work out of that folder tonight. So I'm gonna go back, we're gonna choose our six up DT and click the update button. When I click the update button, it brings it over. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna do just the base formations and essentially just show you how to drop plays in. And then, because I know we have a lot of PowerPoint users, I'm gonna to start to show you the customization on that end and show you how to build things out. But I'm gonna go into the PQD Visio samples, offensive formations, and we're gonna give you six formations to start with. Well, I'm going to go to the advanced button, add all drawings, and go add drawings to playbook. Well, what does that do is that allows you to create a queue of drawings, and it's going to automatically pump those drawings into that document. So if you're working across multiple concepts or formations or anything like that, you're creating that queue. From a defensive standpoint, you're sitting here going, all right, I've got inside runs, and I'm going to pull from a you know, bucket of uh, beer options, zone read, RPOs, things like that. Well, instead of having to bounce from different folders and add them, you're using that advanced button that's going to allow you to boom, 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 click and drop those in. So those are just some base formation drawings that we give coaches in terms of how it looks from a PQD standpoint.
you're probably already sitting here thinking, well, yeah, that's a that's a NCAA college field. Do you have CFL fields? And yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> so uh, I'm probably going to stay in a little bit of American football to start with and then transition over and show you how to build that. But those are just some sample formation drawings. And the field actually acts as the background for your drawing. Well, now I'm going to get into the run game and go drop in 24 Patriot versus odd cover four. Well, here's a sample run drawing that we provide. And the biggest difference here is that there is no field that determines the size of your drawing. Well, if I select this drawing and click edit, it's going to open up that specific drawing. And like I said before, we're one drawing, one page. So it doesn't matter the size of your drawing. What matters is the ratio of how that drawing fits because this is essentially a four by three ratio drawing. And the reason it's four by three is that's how I like to work in terms of the PowerPoint world. I don't like the widescreen. I like the more squared look. So this square drawing allows me to essentially have it fit my six up box right here. But if I take that same drawing and I add it to a different template, so I'm gonna hit the add button and it's gonna drop in a new page well, I'm going to double click that same drawing. And what does it do? It drops the title up in the top of my page, but here's my card or my drawing. And it automatically essentially copy and paste it and stretches it for me. So there's no need anymore with our software to use the snip tool to copy and paste this, drop it as an image to resize it. And this is if you're working in Visio. And, and the most important piece of this that I want you to understand is you do not have to have Visio in order to use Pro Quick Draw. If you guys are using Microsoft PowerPoint, you can 100% do all of the same things that I'm doing here in the world of PowerPoint. But I just wanted to start off in Visio because you know this is the big thing in terms of, of, of where people have gone in, in terms of using football and using technology and, and what coaches in the league are using to draw. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to select a, a, my six up again and click the update button. And now we're gonna go on to the defensive side. So in terms of Visio samples and defensive drawings, we're gonna drop in a nickel flex strong fire zone versus the blue train formation. So here's my drawing. And when I zoom in, you can kind of see how it looks. Well, we're gonna take this same exact drawing right here and turn it into a Canadian drawing in terms of adding the 12th man on the field. Well, I'm going to select that drawing and go up to save as. So if you're working in Visio, now all you have to do is go back out to my sample library and I'm going to grab that blank folder structure and I'm going to copy it and paste it. And then within that blank folder structure, you can start to rename it. So here's our CFL demo and I'll call it Visio because I'll do the same thing in PowerPoint here. But I've renamed that playbook. We're going to drop in and I'm on the defensive side of ball. We're gonna start with just a base coverage and you can call it whatever you want. Well, this is actually sub blitz, so that's where we're gonna stay. And now we're gonna change it to, uh, you know, we'll just call it spread right is the first defense or the first offense that we're gonna see. So once I type in that word spread right, it's gonna create that brand new play. And then up here, you just change the name of the title in terms of what that formation looks like. And then a Visio shortcut to duplicate a player is if I hold down the control key and click and drag, well, then I can change this. And here's our W player to create the 12th man. And then if you needed to create another guy on defense, you can drop that in right there, call it whatever you want. And I've changed this. And then you start to adjust all your different arrows in terms of how you want that to look as well. On the left side of the screen, what you'll notice, this is a Visio feature which they call stencils. And a stencil is really beneficial because I can sit in here and then let me change this and come back in. So I can sit up here and here's some run blocks that I can drop in, but Pro Quick Draw is gonna offer just a simple set of stencils. And when I choose that PQD stencil, if I had an edge blitz or a DB roll, we give you those features. So now you can just drop in that specific diagram and there it lives and you can adjust those arrows as well that you want. The other key piece in understanding is that you can add to this or create your own set of stencils. So that way, anytime you wanna keep using the same things, 
don't draw it more than once. You draw it one time, you add it to your bucket, you save your bucket. And anytime you make an edit to a drawing, you have those pieces that you can utilize. So we've got our 12 men on the field. We've called it spread right. So now we need to get it into an actual spread right formation. There we go. I'm able to close it and save it. And it's going to do two things. It's going to update within this box right here for me. So you, now you can see spread right. But here's our CFL demo defense. Okay, We go back into our sub pressures and they're spread right. Well, I'm going to double click spread right and drop it into box two. And now we may call it uh, doubles right far for our next formation. Select that drawing, click save as it opens up. We'll go doubles right far and we close it and save it. It generates that brand new file. And this is the process where coaches are really getting to speed up because now you're not having to search for a diagram that looks similar. You know exactly what you're working off of. So now I'm able to go to doubles right far. I can stretch that out to keep it nice and clean. All right, well, doubles right far is right there. So we're on, he's on the line of scrimmage as well. All right, we're able to close it and save it. And like I said before, it's gonna do our two things. It's gonna update that diagram right here. And then it generates that play in our defensive folder in terms of our sub pressures and being able to drop that in. So why is that important? Is because it allows you to work in the same folder and keep organizing and you continue to add to your library of drawings as you're getting a roll. So, that to me is a big key piece to it. And the area that I wanna transition now is taking your diagrams and dropping them into PowerPoint. This is where it gets to be a real big pain in the ass for coaches is you're gonna make your diagram. So you've got your six drawings here. All right, I'm gonna go right back into the Visio samples. We're gonna drop in six passes. So I'm gonna one, two, three, four, five, and six. Add drawings to playbook. So here's our nice little pass install for day one. And the big key piece here is that this is your handout for your players that you're going to print, you email it to them, whatever. But then it's going to come into terms of that. We've got to get into our unit meeting and present this to our players. Well, for you as a coach, you're having to do what? You're having to go to your single box. You're copying it. You're opening PowerPoint. You're pasting it. You're resizing Huge pain, a lot of time being wasted right there for you guys. Where with us, we sit here and we go to export. We're going to choose a PPTX single file. And like I said, I'm going to kick it out to my standard version. Then I'm able to choose any of the templates that I have in my library and click this transform to template button. I'm then able to save that wherever I want. So if I click export, I'm then able to pull out those six drawings and create six slides without having to copy and paste anything. The big part in understanding about the library too is we're not necessarily a cloud-based software, but we have cloud capabilities. And what I mean by that is this library is currently on my C drive. Well, if you guys are using Google Drive or OneDrive at your school, you can connect your library to that Google Drive folder and all of your coaches are now connected and being able to utilize that library of plays. So your defensive line coach may be drawing the opponent runs, your DB's coach may be drawing the opponent pass, and then you're the, the coordinator and you're gonna present, you know, here's the five top runs, here's the top five passes. And you're just double clicking and dropping those plays in. And the reason I say that is that Coach Cully, uh, at, who was recently at the Ravens, he's now the head coach of the Texans, he hasn't drawn a play in 30 years, but he used pro quick draw every single day because he knew that he could navigate this library full of drawings and drop it into a diagram and have it up and running for his guys. So that's a big key piece is don't be intimidated by how this looks. Well, because I exported that drawing and it came out as drawing 16, we're gonna open up that specific PowerPoint and here's your converted drawings from Visio right into PowerPoint. And the only difference is, is that these are flat images and you're not able to edit them. Well, if you want to have the capability to edit, all you have to do is you turn on that toggle panel. We're going to go to select template. I'm going to choose to add, and we're going to drop in the same Visio plays that we just had from before. So when I drop in the Glock right Sting 61 Houston, that play is going to be pulled specifically into PowerPoint. 
Well, let's say that the, the coach accidentally got this wrong. The flat is the number one receiver that you're targeting and the curl is number two. Select that drawing and click edit. And then it's gonna open up that specific file within Visio. Then it's just a matter of going into Visio. All right, I'm gonna to go to Control H, Control J, and that's gonna flip it horizontally and vertically, which ends up ultimately flipping the one and the two right there. So I'm able to close it and save it, and it does our two things. It updates automatically within my PowerPoint slide right here, but then it also updates in the back end in my library so that anytime another coach who's on our software in our library uses that drawing, it's the correct version. Well, why does that become important? Is because guys are going to be drawing all day and may make a mistake. Well, you as the coordinator, you're able to pull that up and make that change. Well, after all those changes have been made by the coordinator, we got to refresh our document because I may have changed 16 different things. Then you just come in and you go refresh all drawings and then boom, that's going to automatically update every single one of those drawings that coaches have made changes to. Because everybody always runs into the problem in the office of going, hey, will you change uh, close out of that drawing so I can make an update? And then you're sending emails and texts constantly telling coaches to get out of a document. Now, if you're the only guy using it, doesn't matter. You're up and running and, and you're able to utilize that. So that to me is a big key piece and just wanted to kind of show you a taste of what Visio looks like in, in terms of drawing. But if you want to know exactly how it works and how it runs and if you want to learn how to use it, you can go to our website and watch a couple free tutorials. Like I said, we got four hours worth. Now, in terms of working in PowerPoint, how, how can I utilize PowerPoint now in PQD to speed up my workflow? Well, we're going to turn on our toggle panel and in the PowerPoint samples, we're going to work inside. Uh, we can go 16 by nine for this. So I'm going to go to 16 by nine and I'm going to take an original PQD formation called Glock Louis Slot. Well, I'm going to choose a, a, a four up and go update. So we've chosen our template and I'm going to double click the first play that is in the system and it's dropped in and here it lives. Well, I want to create this and turn it into a Canadian style drawing. So I select that drawing and we go to save as. I go to save as, just like we did with our CFL demo for Visio, we're going to take that blank folder structure, copy and paste it. All right. And then here's our CFL demo for our PowerPoint folder. Then we're gonna dive right into that. We go to offense, we go to offensive formations. And is anybody out there listening? Give me a quick formation name. Week right. All right, so I'm gonna go week right. That's the name of my formation. I'm gonna close it and save it. <clears throat> this is gonna pull up. And currently this diagram is mapped out for a college American football field. Well, I can right click that and go format background. I want to insert a picture source. And the reason I do this is you don't want to copy and paste a picture as your background because I've been guilty. You're going to click that field on accident and it's going to take off and move on you. Then you got to go to control Z and then you're trying to layer things. It's awful. I've been there. By layering the format background, it allows you to essentially place it as a flat image and now you can't touch it. Well, within the PQD folder, we're gonna offer you a background that's specific to the CFL field. You choose the CFL 16 by nine, insert that, and there's your CFL or your Canadian League hash marks to scale for your PowerPoint. Then it starts to go, all right, well, here's our week right formation. So we've got, uh, there's our Y, I can duplicate the T right here. We make them W. All right, so there's our W, here's our T. Let's say you don't wanna use ovals, you wanna use circles. Sounds good. I'm able to group that. We can shrink up that circle. We can make it a little bit larger as well so it fits on the diagram better. If you don't wanna use colors, you can change the shape fill to white. You can do whatever you want. This is pure customization how you want your playbook to look. If your receivers are blue and they're not red, you change them right there. If you want a custom font, you change it right there. But here is our 12 players. 
The way I teach things, we always drop it on the left hash. So there's week right. I'm able to then close it and save it. Week right is going to automatically drop in. But you go, well, I want to see our field in the background. That's why I dropped it in there. Within PQD, I'm able to go to the home button and go to settings, and you're able to add that same background image that we chose for our original slide. So here's our CFL 16 by nine. I go to open, I click OK, and now I'm able to refresh that drawing and it's going to drop in my field. And here's your start of your four up with week right. I'm going to go right back to my CFL demo offense. And now because you're working inside this specific diagram, let's say that you wanted to show a, a zoom motion, which means my Z is going all the way across. So I'm going to double click and add week right, single click, save as, and here's week right, zoom. Well, I don't want that in my formation category. This goes into my motion example. So we click save. Well, what does a motion look like? To me, I always showed motions with a dotted line. So we've got our Z right here. I'm going to choose my arrow. And I'm able to click that draw it all the way across. And then you start giving it your shape properties. So my shape outline is red because it's tagged with the receiver. I make it a little bit thicker. And then I'm gonna drop in some dashes to always show a dash pre-snap as my motion. Now that's your zoom and I get it too with, your, with the Canadian leagues. You may have backs that are going up field, whatever. It's totally up to you however you want that to look. But PowerPoint, is actually simple to draw in. And I can't believe I'm saying that because three years ago, I would have told you you were full of it. But there's my zoom motion. So week right zoom, right back to our playbook offense. We've got motions. Well, now let's draw a pass game out of week right. So I'm gonna drop in week right zoom. And now we're just gonna go with week right zoom 61 drive. Selected that drawing. We go to save as, back to offense. Now we're in the pass game. Well, you know what? I'm going to create a folder for drive because I may have 16 different ways that we run drive. So here's drive, week right zoom, 61 drive is the concept. Now it comes into how can I draw pass routes fairly easily? Well, there's a free form button within the shapes that's going to allow you to draw a curved line, a straight line, a bend, whatever. Well, I'm going to grab the freeform tool and I'm going to single click to start my line. And if I single click again, it allows me to choose a bend. Well, I want a post route. So there's my post. We go back to our shape outline. We make it red. We're able to change the weight. And now I want to change the arrow end cap. Well, once I get that first pass route loaded as to how I want it to look, you right click that drawing or that specific route and you go set as default shape. But why is that important? Because now I'm able to then choose my freeform tool again. And our drive route is going to be a shallow cross from the Z who single clicks to start right there. And then I'm going to double click because he finishes over here. Well, if you right click that line and go to edit points, there's a beginning and an ending black line or a black end cap. And if you select that, it gives you the ability to bevel that line however you want. So he's going to start up field. We're crossing at the four to five yard range. And then I'm able to finish it right there. And notice I didn't have to go to the weight change. You set that default shape to get it however you want it to look. So there's our concept. We're going to go right here to our X. Boom, he's at 12, all right? And if you make a mistake, Control-Z is always a good friend. So boom, there's my single click. There's our dig right there. And if the Y is a vertical or if he's flat, we do the same thing. So single click to start, double click to finish, right click E for edit. Boom, right here, okay? Right click the E to edit. All right, he's able to go flat. And then now I'm just changing the shape color to match that tight end. Once you're done, we close it and save it. And here's our drive concept. And it's going to automatically drop in. There's your field. Everything is all in the same proportion. Well, once you've got that specific drawing, you're taking that same drive route. So I'm just going to use the search button and go drive. Well, here's 61 drive. 
Then if you need to make any type of adjustment, well, I don't want to run Zoom with it. So you go save as. Well, now we're going to delete out the Zoom part. Here it is, it opens up that specific play. And instead of, like I said before, trying to find that route, copy and paste it, well, now you're dropping it in. And if you wanna flip that route, you're able to flip it right there, except now because there's no Zoom, maybe we're running the dig. PowerPoint also allows you to create your own tab. So if I wanted to flip this guy horizontally, I just hit the flip horizontal button and there's our tight end route that I just flipped. The other piece that I think is a really good nugget is distribute horizontally. Well, I want the Z to be lined up exactly apex between the right tackle and the X receiver. Well, if I highlight all three of those players, because that Z is in the middle, I can go distribute horizontally. And now that Z is going to exactly split the difference. So for all you defensive guys that are drawn apex and you've been tapping on your screen trying to get that thing to roll <laughs> don't do it anymore let the program work for you and that's just powerpoint that is not a pqd piece right there so there's our drive concept we drop that in all right and you can do whatever you want with it but we close it and save it and then there's our separate version of that week right zoom well there's your four up that you print and you give to your players and now you go well i want to create four powerpoint slides so I can present this in my meeting for my players, but I also wanna add video to it. Sounds good. You're gonna go up here to convert template and you're gonna choose your drop down now for whichever type of drawing you want. So I'm gonna choose my DT2. All right, here's our meeting number one. I click convert and just like the Visio export from Visio to PowerPoint, the convert template button goes from a PowerPoint to a PowerPoint. So there's your four slides that you just created for your meeting. Ah, you know what? We need to make a change. I need to edit this. That Z route should live underneath the Z receiver so it cleans up your drawing. Go right back. We edit that. We're going to select our Z receiver. Go to arrange, bring to front. There he lives. We close it. We save it. It does our two things. It updates here, but then you go, shoot, my handout needs to be updated. All right, coach, sounds good. You go right back to it. I'll zoom in so you guys know that I'm not lying. And we're going to go up to PQD, refresh all drawings. And that's going to go through and pick all four of your slides. And then you'll see that Z receiver, whoop, he popped right over that. So you're able to make those changes, but then quickly make those other changes with the same play across all your different documents. So that to me is a, a really big key piece. Um, and I know I'm about halfway through time. So like I said, if you have any questions, you're always welcome to hit us on our website or on the chat tonight. I want to leave a little bit of time for some questions if things come through as well, coach. Um, but that's an idea in terms of, you know, different presentation material and taking it to it. Well, we talked about adding video to this. Well, if we turn our toggle panel back on up here in the top right hand corner, you're going to notice that there's a tab that says videos. You can take an individual film clip and save it as its own file and drop it into whatever folder you want inside your PQD library and have access to that. So if you've got an image where you wanted to show a weak right formation, if you're using Huddle, you snip tool, you click and drag, you copy it, you save that image as weak right. Well, imagine that I had a weak right image in here. So I'm gonna go to my images folder go to my game grabs and I can add line return. Well, when I add that, it's going to drop in that specific one, but I had a, the wrong template selected. So let's update that. All right. So I can update that slide and now line return. I drop that in and just imagine for the sake of the concept that that was actually a picture of weak, right? So from an instructional piece, you're showing your players a 2d image of how it is drawn. And then you're showing your players, what it looks like in terms of an actual picture from a game film. Then you take it one step further and you go, I want to show us breaking the huddle. You've got motions or whatever. You go into your videos file. You go to your presentation to whatever it is. You go to your game clip. And then you're going to add that specific play and it drops in. And there's your presentation. You've got your 2D image. You've got your screen grab of what it looks like. And then you've got your video if your guys were to break the huddle in terms of what that looks like. And this is all done within PowerPoint. Then you do the same thing in terms of your drive concept. 
you know, to me, there's so many different ways that you can start to utilize the images and videos to, to really communicate effective pieces to your players. You know, one of the things I, I think is great is in that images is saving your logos or whatever you want. And these become your tempo calls. Well, let's say that we've got a, a pressure that's going to be Carolina adjust, but the code name, the tempo calls Panther, Panther, Panther. Well, I've got a logo of Carolina Panthers. We drop that in. And I want that to live in my four up diagram. So we're going to drop in our Panther logo. Box two is going to be our 2D image of the Panther Blitz. So I'm going to go right into my master library. All right, we go into our defensive folder. We've got sub pressures. Here's Nickel Flex Carolina. Here's what it is versus two by two. This is what it looks like versus three by one. And then down here in box four, if I had that specific cut up from a game, I'm able to drop that and add it into the final box. So as a coach, in terms of you presenting, hey, guys, here's a nice little visual of Carolina Panthers, Panther, Panther, Panther. Well, what is that? That's our pressure labeled Carolina left. If we get this, the blitz is coming from the left. If we get three by one, it's coming from the right. And then, boom, here's your video and what that example looks like. In terms of just layering and teaching, you're giving three different learning styles for players, just dropping it in right there. That library that you can utilize, you just it, it then starts to bleed into so many different aspects of different use cases and how you can use it. The one that I'm just a, a huge fan of is my scout cards. You know, I, I was in charge of drawing the, the run game uh, when I was drawing, when I was GA. And so to have a library of run cards where I don't have to draw power off the left hash for the fourth day in a row, because it rained on my cards the last two days and have a library that I can just double click and throw it in to me is, is priceless. So I drop that in and now I'm going to choose my template and choose my scout card and click the update button. Now it changes. Here's my scout card. This is stock that we give you. So I'm going to go right back into the PQD folder for defense. Okay. We're going to go into our opponent breakdown folder run game. Well, I'm going to pick out four runs. So here's our power. I want one snap of power. It adds the field in the background, but hold up. These are run cards. I don't care about the guys in the perimeter. Just get your ass lined up. So we're going to go in and we're going to disable our field background because I want to blow that image up. So I come back in a PQD. I'm going to refresh that drawing and then boom, it blows it up right there. How pro quick draw works is we are looking at all of the objects in your diagram. Well, if I go to control A, these are all the objects. So PQD recognizes that this is the size of your diagram and we're going to expand it to fit whatever template you choose. So the reason why that can be important is, is if you're the D-line coach and you're literally drawing inside runs and you don't draw any guys on the perimeter, and you want your card to look good. This is the best way to do it because now you take that run game power, you put your parentheses O-line in there because now it's just the, it's the core of the formation. And now you've got a run card that I copied and pasted and saved and I just deleted the perimeter guys. And here's your card that's blown up really nice and pretty so that you can utilize it. Well, how do you draw a run? What's that process look like real quick? And I'm gonna go into edit. And all these are, is they're just little end caps that you can then group. And the way that I draw a run is first, I would always right click and set that blocking shape as my default object. So now I can take a run and draw my end cap as my blocking shape right there. We go into here, here's the Y, boom, there's that line drawn. Let's say if you had a puller, how can I draw a pulling guard going up the mic right here? All right, free form tool, just like we talked about earlier. I'm gonna click it single, I wanna show the pull right there, and then he's got a finish on the front half of the mic over here. Double click. Now I want to right click E to edit points, and now there's three black boxes. Well, I don't want to touch the first one, so I can leave that, and now I'm going to bevel this because he's going to get his big butt all the way out there, and then I'm beveling this line, which allows me to get around that double team, and then if I want to draw that end cap, well, you just control D to duplicate it from another object, and there it lives, and now you're cutting off that mic. But that's just a quick run through in terms of how you draw using PowerPoint. But back to the, the main concept of why I want that 
why we're doing this is these are my inside runs. So there's run number one, here's run number two. All right, we want a toss play in there. So here's my toss, all right, and then we're gonna drop in a counter. So here's our four inside runs for our walkthrough. Well, I'm able to delete that and notice up here at the top, there's card one, card two, card three, card four. It numbers automatically for you. So now all you have to do is you go to file print and you're writing in the information. If you don't wanna type it in, you're able to still do that. You drop the call in. Well, why is this beneficial? Is that, let's say you had 15, 16 plays on here. Well, that turns into your, your, your run script for to hand your coaches. Some of you guys may not have coaches who are well-versed in the language and terminology and what you guys are talking about. And they would benefit more from pictures just as much as the players would. So if you're able to compile all this and you go, all right, well, here's our eight cards. You go back and you use that convert template button and you choose your drop down. You choose a nine up because maybe you got nine runs. Well, here's your inside runs. You click convert. It pulls out those eight plays. It throws it into your new PQD template for a nine up. You change the top of this to inside runs and print. And you're just using all of that to speed up the process and we're not having to draw anything. And bam, there's your inside run periods and today is Wednesday. So there's our inside runs. And now the benefit to this is you're correcting kids off of pictures. You've got multiple coaches who can help out with scout team now because it's not just the guy that's holding the book. Everybody has these diagrams. You're able to drop those in. And that's a nice piece, but the problem is, is that from a scout card perspective, how this looks or how this looks, a coach has to do what? He's flipping the book to show the offense what these blocks look like. Well, not with PQD, we got to flip all drawings button. I go to flip all drawings and then bam, this is going to pump every single drawing and flip it right there on the hash for me. And now you're going file print and you're going to have a specific card with your offense on the bottom and the defense on the top, and you only had to draw it once. That's why this is so powerful because you're not wasting your time taking all this and drawing and scratching out and squiggles. And, you know, the guy that draws the cards, the other coaches don't even know what it is. <laughs> you, know? you keep things crisp and clean and it's the same pieces on a week to week basis. And your kids know exactly what everything means. And it's color coded you're laid out. It, it looks really good. And, and that to me is a, from a defensive perspective, that is how I would use this from an offensive perspective. You know, I think that you use the presentation material, but the other nice piece is that we're going to give you not just landscape templates. We give you templates that we can change. And now we're going to work in the portrait world. So just like that eight up or the six up that you saw earlier, well, here's your six up in terms of PowerPoint. And then I'm going right back into my toggle panel. We go back to our PowerPoint. We go to our offensive stuff. All right. Uh, all right. We were working in formations. So there's week right. So boom, you've dropped in your week right formation. You come down into your pass game. We've got drive. Here's our one drive concept. Here's our second drive concept. Now you're creating tips and reminders for your players or however you want in terms of install documents in terms of the six up, or you can choose our playbook pass template and go update. Then you drop in that same 61 drive concept and all of these are editable fields. What's the formation? It was weak, right? What's the protection? It's a blast. You know, what's the series? It's our 60 series. Tight end, what's your rule? You start typing in those. And then, like I said earlier, all this stuff is custom. If you guys want to change whatever the verbiage is here, you have the capability to do so. So there's your run, uh, your pass diagram, you know, from a defensive coverage or a defensive front or a definition. Hey, guys, we're going to explain to you what exactly cover four is. Well, what is cover four? We're going to go in to our base coverages. I'll get out of this one. Defense, base coverages, all right? Over, cover four. Alignments, responsibilities. We're going to drop in responsibilities. So here's cover four versus, you know, Trey Dot. 
Well, what is this concept? The concept is a four deep coverage to take away deep shots. You know, what's the coaching points? Linebackers have to reroute. Number two, what's the strength? What's the weaknesses? There's so many different things in here from a just a basic functionality that you can take to teach your players, to teach your coaches. And like I said before, you don't have to redraw everything. You draw it once you have it. So it takes you about a year to get everything in. But once it's in year two, you're not, you're not doing this again. You're double clicking and you're making adjustments and you're up and rolling. And it's, I can't tell you how many compliments we get from folks. And after a year, the first year is a grind. But that second season or that second training camp, they're like, man, I'm, I'm done in five minutes. I have all my cards from last year's season that when we go to spring practice, we want run the report. What were the top five formations we saw? What were the top five passes? What were the top five runs? There's your spring practice right there. Boom, 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 boom. You're double clicking and everything and dropping it in. And the last uh, you know, couple minutes that I want to show everybody is our Playmaker Pro feature that we, we created here recently. Everybody and their sisters got Playmaker Profile drawings from just years of trading playbooks and getting online material and downloading stuff. <clears throat> the number one complaint is it's very difficult to get those drawings into a presentable piece to, to show your players in your unit meeting. Well, now with PQD, this is included in the purchase. You go to your Playmaker Pro tab, and I'm going to go to the export button. The export button takes a Playmaker Pro diagram and it drops it into any of the templates that you choose that you have made within Pro Quick Draw. So I'm going to select the three dots here, go into my downloads or my documents desktop. All right, here we go. Playmaker Pro, go to my test folder, and I've got three runs from the Giants Dallas game. I'm going to click open, and then I can choose whichever template we want. So I'm just going to choose a, a you know, a two up diagram here. You can flip the drawings if you want. You can even add a field background. Well, when I click convert, I'm now taking a presentation that had three runs and I've dropped it into a PQD template, which is known as our two up. So here's our, because I'm working in portrait, there it is. There's your diagram taken from Playmaker Pro and dropped it directly into PowerPoint in that specific template. The number one question we get is, can you edit that? Well, you can, but not in this method and how we just did that. So we're going to create our new document. All right, I'm going to go back to my Playmaker Pro button, and now we're going to click the Convert PowerPoint. The Convert the PowerPoint button takes that Playmaker Pro file and drops it into one slide per drawing. So I click my three dots. We go back to our three runs. I'm going to click Convert. Drawing one, drawing two, drawing three. That has been successfully converted. So here's our three drawings. And then like coach asked, can you take that motion and shorten it up? Yes, you can. Because now we've converted all of the drawings here into an editable fashion within PowerPoint. Hey, I want number 10 to become highlighter yellow. Shape fill, highlighter yellow. That's who we're throwing to on this play. You've got all the functionality of PowerPoint. So then you're going to come in here. You're going to drop in a text box. 26 is one hell of a ball carry. Whatever. Doesn't matter. It's all the same functionality of PowerPoint and being able to, to run with it. The third step of this process is you go, well, I want to add these to my pro quick draw library so I can throw it into any template that I want. Sounds good, coach. We're going to create our new doc, our new diagram. Playmaker Pro, all right, now we're gonna choose the import file. We select that import file, we click our three dots, we choose those three runs, okay? And then you have the ability to choose whatever sample folder you want this to go into. Then you can organize it and create folders of all the files that you import. So I click okay, it takes those three runs, and now what that's doing is it's that is adding those three plays to our toggle panel. So if we go back to a previous presentation, I can turn on that toggle panel. And the reason why this is important is if you've got coaches who are stubborn and they don't want to draw their scout cards in the PQD format because they've been drawn in Playmaker Pro for years and they think that they can draw better, sounds good, coach. Have at it. 
because now we save those Playmaker Pro drawings in here. There's my CFL demo. Here's our runs. And then I can double click that play and have it drop into any of my templates. And then I had this specific template chosen. So that's why it came in. So I'm going to go back and choose my scout card template to prove you wrong. Bless you. All right. So I go update. Double click, and then here's my Playmaker Pro drawing pulled directly in here. Let's say a coach had made a mistake or we need to highlight the ball carrier. Select that drawing, click edit. It pulls up that specific play. Click here, go to my shape fill. So we show that's the ball carrier. We close it and save it. And now your scout card has been updated as well. Now, let's say that you're a football junkie and you've got 75,000 documents and plays and you want to add that to your Pro Quick Draw library. We're going to choose the Playmaker Pro button, but now we're going to go to Upload Folder. Well, when I select that Upload Folder button, I'm going to select that diagram. All right, so I'm able to go to my uh, desktop, Playmaker Pro, all right, Sub Blitz. And I, I don't want to take this Sub Blitz because I'm going to show you <laughs> the length of it and what it did. But this is 121 drawings that dropped in and it organized it into my folders. So I'm gonna to go to Playmaker Pro, Sub Blitz, and then here it is. There's my Eagle Blitz Trail Hornet. I'm able to then go to PQD, choose a four up, click update, and then here is play one, play two, play three, play four. So there's the different examples of, of being able to pull that in. I've dropped in even lightning, same thing. You throw these into any template you want, and like I said, if you need to make changes or edit or you want to change the old font, doesn't matter. It's, it's totally up to you and, and however you want that to look. So that to me is it, from a time saving standpoint of having coaches, you know, if you've got a coach on staff who's young, he's good, he's working in Visio. You got another coach who's drawn in PowerPoint, another coach who's drawn in Playmaker Pro. You now have the ability to combine everybody into one piece and being able to utilize that to get it into the hands of your players in terms of utilizing PQD. Um, I hope that was beneficial. I know that it's, you know, there's a lot to it. It, it is a lot at first, um, but Coach Brennan can definitely be an advocate and you've got specific questions that you don't want to ask and because you don't want to hear a sales guy. I'm sure he, he can definitely help out and answer anything. Absolutely. That was awesome. So when we were just setting things up, Kevin was just making sure his uh, everything was okay for the sharing of the video and everything. And he mentioned that Playmaker Pro deal and it was like, blew my mind. Uh, I teared up a little just looking at how easy it was because that's the big thing, you know, when you move around in this profession, you end up with libraries of different files everywhere and different dot blah 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 all these because all these different programs and just seeing that that's an amazing feature you guys have put in there uh and, and i'm not getting paid to say any of this stuff but it, that's man that's huge right there that's huge so whoever wrote that code and uh, i'd give them a hug if we weren't <laughs> in our quarantine time right now absolutely um <clears throat> Man, but thank you all for the time. I'm going to drop my email um, in the chat right here. And it's just uh, Kevin at proquickdraw.com. And then lastly, I'm just going to finish with just showing you our website um, to make it really, really simple for you. But if you go to proquickdraw.com, it went full screen on me. There we go. But if you go up here, and you go to trial and pricing, you can request a free trial by clicking that button, or you can come in here and request it. Just give us a couple bit of pieces of information right there. Um, video tutorials are gonna be linked directly to how the Pro Quick Draw software works and, and different tips and tricks and using that. We've got previous webinars that we've gone through uh, this season or this season, I guess, was Pro Quick Draw centric. It was how to build your playbook, you know, expanding within Visio and PowerPoint and getting into the nitty gritty and pieces and showing you that. And then lastly, it was kind of integrating a couple other pieces in terms of the video and just getting into some advanced features. So if you've got time, you want to see what else PQD can do in terms of workflow, you're welcome to go there. 
But the biggest one I think, and that's been the most beneficial for folks, has been this Visio and PowerPoint area. You know, we if you're drawing in Visio, we have a shortcut sheet, the control click and drag, control shift P, all that stuff that I was doing. You print this off, put it right next to your computer. It can help you draw and, and save some time. PowerPoint doesn't have a lot of shortcuts in terms of drawing, but there is some functionality things that can help you out. So that's a nice piece to print off for PowerPoint users. But like I said earlier, this is the stuff that is pure gold. Because when I first got to be in a GA, uh, I was using Playmaker Pro. I was at a high school in Georgia and I got, and they were like, hey man, you need to draw this, this, and this on Visio. I was like, what is Visio? They're like, oh shit. <laughs> So there was nothing out there that taught me how to do Visio. It was do it wrong, get cussed out, go back, do it again. Uh, but here's PowerPoint and then there's four hours of Visio content. So we have a lot of resources here for you. You know, we wanted to give back because there wasn't anything when we were coaching and doing all that stuff. And just please use us as a resource. Um, and pricing wise, uh, you know, if, if we could do like a promo code or something like that, but if, if just mention this clinic and, and this event. Um, we can do a, a license. Um, uh, shit, I don't know if Annie's on, but for for the benefit of what you guys have been having to go with, uh, we'll, we'll Come say. On. <laughs> there he is. But uh, Andy, do you want to go through the pricing or you want me to go you, ahead and drop it on everybody? You name the price. You name we'll, it. You're in charge. Yeah, I got you. We'll do uh, $199 for a license and that comes with the PQD stuff and it comes with the Playmaker Pro and and any additional license you want for your staff, it'll just be a hundred. So if you want two licenses, it's two ninety nine. Three licenses, three ninety nine. Keep it simple math. Um, but I, I hope that helps. And Andy, if you want to say anything, please, please go ahead. Hey guys, I just wanted to thank uh, Paul for having us on, and uh, Kevin always does a great job. There's a lot of familiar faces on here. Uh, appreciate Coach Brennan, Chris, Coach Sweet. You know, there's some guys I've, I've come across in my career, and um, literally and truly, this all started just to help me as a coach. And and all we're trying to do is help coaches. Period. I mean, that's, that's really all we're trying to do is help coaches. And the pricing you're getting today is a significant discount uh, from our normal pricing, and we're we're doing that as a as a reach out for Coach. Charbonneau and what he's doing for football. And uh, so, again, if anybody's got any questions, be happy to answer them. That's awesome. We appreciate that. It's it's a great program. All the guys are raving about it. Peter, we would have got a lot more sleep if we had this program when uh, we were working together in Montreal. <laughs> well, thanks a lot for jumping on, Kevin. Thanks, Andy, for jumping on, too. Uh, and then... Uh, you guys got his um, his email address, and I'll throw the email on, on YouTube Live as well. Uh, we had a bunch of people watching there too. Awesome. We'll be able to reach out, reach out to you that way too. So uh, once again, appreciate you jumping on. Um, and then uh, if anybody had any quick questions, just go ahead and unmute yourselves and, and ask now while uh, while you got them on. everyone's mind is just blown right now with how easy that was. So. Awesome. Well, coach, thank you so much for your time. I, I appreciate it. I wish everybody uh, good health and everything and, and y'all take care of this is an awesome event. Thank you guys for letting me join. Have a good one. Thanks everybody for having us. We'll see you. All righty. Well, those guys just showed us uh, the Ferrari version of uh, now what, uh, what Gabe's going to do is uh, take us back to uh, a little bit more of the Ford Escort. I think uh, Gabe, there you are. So, so uh, Sharps and I weren't taught in much contact this past week. So I lined Gabe up to do a PowerPoint presentation earlier in the winter time. Uh, some of the guys that didn't necessarily have access to film were, were putting some stuff together for us as we, uh, we had these clinics every Wednesday night and uh, Gabe kind of got into the nuts and bolts of PowerPoint and ended up uh, sort of uh, becoming a, our resident master of the animation stuff. So he's going to take us through a 15 or 20 minute presentation and uh, sort of tie this back again. Uh, that price that uh, the guys just offered us on the call was pretty awesome. Gabe's going to, what he's going to show us a little bit is obviously something that a lot of us have the, uh, the PowerPoint already on our computer. And I think as Gabe and I talked this past weekend, I was watching the OFA clinic that Tommy Dennison put on and, and what Gabe's going to demo for us a little bit is, sort of falls back in right now where even if you can't get back on the field with some of your players 
what Gabe's going to show us is, is some opportunity of, of Tommy showed uh, basically his, his quarterbacks working on coverages, right? So as the, as the slideshow moves around, what reads would uh, the quarterback, who would he throw to the receiver and stuff like that. So as Gabe and I set this up for tonight, we, uh, that's kind of what he's going to, uh, going to show us. So uh, Gabe, no pressure to follow uh, Kevin there. He was pretty fast on the old mouse as he moved around, but, uh, but I know you're a, you're a pretty handy guy when it comes to this stuff as well. So it's all yours, Gabe. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, I uh, feel a little bad coming in here and, and giving uh, after a sort of a, a very kind, generous sales pitch, giving you the cheap free version around the corner. But um, obviously, if you're doing this for real, you want the good stuff. There's a lot of great programs out there. Um, some of them are very expensive. Some of them are really powerful. What I'm really trying to talk about tonight is something that everybody has uh, or at least has access to. And worst case scenario, you buy a, a Microsoft Office package for 60 or 80 bucks and you get Word, you get PowerPoint, uh, you get Excel. And of course, there's some value in the fact that they're all interwoven. You can use any of those formats uh, together. So I'm gonna share my screen. I threw together a little, um, oh, please enable screen saving sharing, uh, Rick. Um, I threw together a short presentation. Um, as I'm often, I often talk a little fast and move a little fast. So please, if there's ever a moment where you feel like you've, I've lost you, just give me a shout and I'll, I'll go over it. I'm going to um, try to make this very simple. Uh, I'm going to talk momentarily about the archive detail, uh, which is very similar to what um, we got it now. Yeah, there we go. Um, here we go. Let me just get my, come on, there we go. Um, so yeah, PowerPoint, a coaching tool. I'll run through some of this stuff. Um, as you probably understand, this is a presentation. I'll talk about this a little more later. Um, but it's important from the very outset to understand the difference between what I call an archive, which PowerPoint does very well. Uh, Kevin, a moment ago, was calling it a library, a very similar idea. Um, and it was actually JP that explained, JP Aslan, who explained the sort of just how much you can do with this PowerPoint, this very cheap free program or, or available program uh, as an archive. And I'll talk about that in a bit. But the other side of it is, is all of the uh, very impressive things you can do once you learn the program to use it as a uh, presentation tool, and of course, convert that into teaching documents and all the things you need to do as a coach and all the ways that you can save time and, and energy repeating these things. So I'll go over some of the stuff. First of all, PowerPoint, why? It's cheap, it's available, it's ubiquitous. There's the gloss, the term ubiquitous for you. Um, very simple program, it, as, as Kevin mentioned, it does, these kinds of programs take a while to get, a, get the hang of. Um, and, but once you get them, man, they're, they're remarkably powerful tools. Um, and the point here is, again, the two sides to this, this program. Um, on one hand, there's this living source document, this archive that you can adjust and update. Uh, you, you put in all your scouting package for a given team or a given game, pull it out in a year, pull it out if you face them in the playoffs. It's all there for you. There's no more losing papers and the rain ruining your stuff. My point here, what I really want to focus on is that this can also be a, a teaching tool. And I know that I'm just scratching the surface, the surface for all the ways that this can be used. Um, but one of the big things here is that once you have that living document, that source document with all of your cutups and all of your, your graphics and so forth, you, it's very easy to move them into presentations. It's very easy to move those into hard copies. It's very easy to simply jump onto one of these cool coaches conferences like this and turn it into an online uh, teaching uh, presentation of some sort. So the parts that you might use this for, again, right now I'm talking about the archive, is all of the text that goes at the beginning of most playbooks, you know, your philosophy, your, your lingo, your terminology, all this stuff. It's just write it in Word and drop it into PowerPoint. Every season from here on, it's all there. Um, you need to update something, you change some of your lingo, great, just update your master document, next team you coach with next season, just update that stuff. The other thing that it does very well is archive all of your diagrams, your plays, um, you know, all of those variations. We just saw a bunch of stuff that's possible uh, a moment ago. Same applies for PowerPoint. You can have headings and subcategories and sub subcategories, break it down by team, break it down by uh, offense, defense, however you want to do deal with the actual archival work. It's very, very simple. Um, and of course, game plan is a big one of those. You figure out your scouting, your prep versus opponent, and it's very easy to turn that into cards 
script the opponent plays and so forth. Simple, straightforward stuff, cheap, free, easy. You just have to basically learn the program. And again, my point here is that there's two sides to this. One is it's a place to store all that information, all those graphics, all that text, everything you wrote about exactly where the first foot goes for this position or that foot position, save it all, pile it up in this archive, this library, turn it into handouts, turn it into um, hard copies, whatever you like, but also turn around and come on a, an evening like this and share all your good work with people like us. Uh, very easy to move that forward. That's why, and, and again, the updating and the and reusing documents, this is a very important piece of what, what this will do for, for us. Um, so again, the key, flexible living document, make it work for you. So this little graphic here, I'm gonna get into starting to show you a few of the fun things you can do with this. Um, this I stole directly from JP. I don't know if he's with us right now, but um, he was good enough to show me his, his own playbook, built in PowerPoint, extremely impressive bunch of documents, um, hundreds of pages on any given season. He just picks the stuff that's relevant, turns it into a new document, very, very straightforward. What you have to understand when you're drawing with PowerPoint or making any kind of graphic with PowerPoint, uh, again, Kevin touched on it very recently. You have to understand we're not simply taking a pencil and drawing on paper. We are always drawing with objects, items, and those items can be edited, changed, moved, grouped. There's a lot of things we can do with the objects, but you have to understand every shape you make is an object that you have to control, arrange, and so forth. They come in various forms, shapes, lines, arrows, whatever you want. You will then affect their format, which is their line, their fill, their size, all these details you can change as you go. You align them, you put them on the page how you like them, copy paste same things apply as almost any computer program you've ever used copy paste all that stuff very similar then you can group them i'll show you how the grouping works in a moment uh and then we'll talk about animations in a few minutes so i'm going to jump out of my screen share or i'm going to keep screen sharing and i jump out of the presentation mode again pay a little attention to this because i am running a presentation right now but you'll see in a moment that i have a set of slides which is basically what i call the archive or the library for this particular presentation so i'm going to jump out of this and uh, I just have to get rid of my own ugly face. There we go. Um, and I'll make this full screen. So you see her on the left, just out of, for those who are really new to this, these are the slides. You'll see all this stuff in a minute. Um, and I'm right now, I'm in the edit panel or, or the, this part of the program where I get to edit these things. You can see I could change words. I could rewrite some stuff. And this is simply what I just said a moment ago. They have some animations to bring them up in a certain order at a certain time. And if you look down here at this thing I stole from JP, um, these are just shapes, simple, simple shapes. And each of those shapes I can move around. I can change the size. I can do various things. I can change the outline to red. There's a lot of things I can do. And one thing that's very important when you're doing this kind of editing, trying to draw your own playbook, I put it right here. I think it might be standard up here in my top left is the undo button, or you use control X or sorry, control Z. Um, you're gonna make a lot of false steps. Oops, I put him in the wrong place, undo, it goes back. That's a very important piece. So just for fun here, I'm gonna draw a defense in very quickly to show you how simple this is. One way to do it is I simply take one of the objects. Again, what you see here are 12 objects and a letter and, a, and then a little title here. This title is just a simple text box. So I'll just steal one of these objects. And if I, the easy way to do it is to right click it, copy it, unselect it, and press paste, which I can also use my right click to paste. You'll see it here. So now you notice I have one copied uh, item which matches the offense. This is an object. And you notice if you look closely, there's some snap lines. These are the, these will let me align to existing objects very easily, very simply. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit, make this a little easier. So what I might be doing here, if I'm trying to draw a defense, which I'll do very quickly for fun, First thing I wanna do is format this stuff. So I may decide as I look at this thing, uh, I think the defense should be have red fill. Um, I guess I have to admit JP, don't tell him I complimented him, please. Uh, so now I only have one, uh, I'm missing 11 players. There's a couple of ways to do this. I could simply copy this, copy and paste. Now I have two players. That's one very, very simple way to do it. Another version I like to use is once you have a couple selected, if you hold control and hover over top, you get this little plus button and you have an automatic copy effect. So I'm not gonna worry too much about my formation, but you can see that I've already snapped to make sure that I'm aligned with the nearby items. 
why don't I select these again and use this copy tool? Now I've got four, obviously they're not in the right place. I'm just trying to do this quickly for fun here. So let me get a half back somewhere over here. Um, linebacker, another backer. Well, I know I need a few more DB, so I'll just do that same copy technique. We've got a high safety um, and you get the idea. I just have to align these guys. Now, the other thing I think is worth understanding, I probably don't have enough guys yet, but just in case, is the question of grouping. And grouping is very useful for animations. Um, if I wanted to say, for example, oops, everybody take a look at this offensive set, this simple for the defense pro left set, however you want to describe it, Trip. Um, you might say, now that we understand what the defense is doing, let's bring in an animation that shows, pardon me, the offense that shows the defense. So it can be quite cumbersome when I start to program animations, which I'll show you in a moment, to use all of these as single individual objects. And that's what grouping is about. It's a very simple thing. If you right click and look here, I can group these things. And now in this document, all of those 12 players are one object, if you follow me so far. What's kind of handy about that is once I have the group selected, I can still affect the exact position of some of these guys. So again, if you think about what some of the stuff Kevin was saying with the six up arrangements, I can simply stamp out a whole bunch of defensive sets or a whole bunch of offensive sets and copy and paste this whole, see, I can go copy, paste, and there it is again. I don't know why I would do that unless I'm building a page full of information. And again, when you have things grouped, you can adjust the position and some of the details about the individual object inside that group. If I want to animate this and I want them all to come in at the same time, I might as well group them. It makes things a fair bit easier. So quick recap here. When you're drawing in PowerPoint, you're drawing with objects, shapes, lines, arrows, et cetera, format, line, and fill, affect that stuff. Um, and then you just simply align the objects where you want them and figure out this grouping if in fact that helps you. So what I'm gonna do here is, is jump back into the presentation mode because right now I'm in the edit mode. And again, what I said earlier about the the archive, these are the slides, you can have sub headings and so on. For now, I just have 12 or 15 slides, very straightforward. Up here, I keep this extra tab here, you can use the slideshow thing, but because of Zoom, most of it's covered on me. So I, I use this as start from this slide, we jump right back into my presentation. You remember the things I said a moment ago, they've all been animated, we'll talk about that now. Animations and coaching. So I'm, of course, partly trying to show you the very, very basics of PowerPoint, how to animate, how to use it. Uh, you're going to have to figure out some of the details of how best to present this stuff. I'll give you a few clues. Um, but the point of all this is to try to figure out how to make this useful for coaches. Film is king, and it's come a long ways in the last little while. I would suggest that sometimes just standing in front of kids and showing them film is a little bit of a lazy way to coach. Um, of course, it's a great way to Coach, not all kids learn that way. And but the point I'm trying to make here is the film isn't always available. It's not always good. And frankly, it's not always the best teaching tool. So that's where you get into this stuff. And although it's a fair bit more complicated in its way, until you start to learn the program, um, you can do a lot of things with it, but you really have to understand what you want to coach. Again, that's what I mean when I say there's this, a degree of laziness to just saying, here's a player who does things right, do what he does. If you're a teacher, I think you'd recognize that that's not really a fully adequate way to teach. We are frequently teachers as coaches, as coaches in the football context. Uh, so I'm saying, let's let's see if we can do a little better than just film. So I um, I'm just going to show you a couple of simple animations, and then we'll talk through how they work and things you can do with it. Here's an arrow. These are just stock arrows and, and explosions and things. Um, you'll notice on the next slide, these very animations have been patched over top of a set of stills. Um, that's me. And this is an example from some piece about, uh, I forget if it was about three point stance and punch and so on. If you remember those animations, here's the first one. Pretty handy way to say you're trying to swing your hands under and up. All I did was took my cell phone, balanced it on a table took a couple of snapshots of me doing these things, took some stills, put them up. You can see how this might be helpful to a young athlete trying to learn how to do this stuff. Uh, whatever you want to say, you say, now you're trying to extend your hands in the last half of the uh, of your, your extension. There's, there's a way to in, indicate, pardon me, indicate that you are uh, striking your opponent. And then you might suggest with this arrow that you're trying to get long and, and extend your arms. You push the hips, you get into a good straight power line. 
Uh, and again, if I rewind that, these are just simple shapes that I've animated the way that they appear on the screen. Really simple, just as a way to, to get us off the ground to start talking about what you can do with this stuff. So animations, here we are. It's the same as before. You're drawing with, an, with objects. You simply align them, arrange them, put them where you want them, adjust how they look, the line, the color, the fill. I'll give you some examples in a bit. Then you add the animations. Animations are very simple. You can do a lot of things with it, but it's really just a question of how those objects come onto your screen. If you do something to make them wiggle around and, and emphasize, and these are just the words you'll see in PowerPoint. Exit, which is, here's one called bounce. It just bounces off of your screen. Um, and then, of course, there's some stuff about what they call advanced animations, and that's where you can do multiple animations, stack them together, or have various certain types of motions. Here's a little football player character I built out of shapes, and you can move them around however you like. So that's your basic primer. We're saying you draw with arrows, you make them look how you like it, and then you add these animations to do what you like. But again, I made this point, you have this archive of slides of information of data, it's infinitely adjustable to work as your database or your library, however you want to say it. But when you are in presentation mode, as I am in right now, that's when these animations work. That's what they're for. How do you get that to your, your students, your athletes, however you want to say it, the other coaches you're working with? Well, you may need to be in a position where you can use PowerPoint in its uh, presentation mode, maybe that's on a, a projector, maybe that's on a computer, maybe you're not able to be on the field, so you're getting your, your group together and teaching over Zoom. Again, they work, the animations work in the presentation according to the triggers that we program. So here's a couple of the basics. I, I'm repeating myself, I re recognize, but you arrange your objects, shapes, text, you apply the animations to them, and I'll show you this in a moment. Uh, the animation pane, and I'll show it to you, is just a way to arrange the types of animations that you're applying to the uh, to the slide and the order in which they happen. Again, I will show you. Then when you feel like you've got some parts together, you simply check the presentation preview to understand what goes on when, when you want to step in front of somebody and start to do this kind of teaching. Here's a couple of very simple approaches to animations that we'll go over. You can always use lines, arrows, and shapes. You can make them fly in to emphasize hands, positions like this. You can have wipe reveals. I'll do that again to suggest he's looking in this direction. Uh, you can have lines appear and disappear, meaning you know maybe you're saying you want a flat back or your the crown of your helmet is not above your butt. There's various things you can say, uh, and of course there's other ways to emphasize things on the graphics or the illustration that you made or the stills from the film that you snapped or the photographs that you took. You can do a lot of this stuff, but you either need to build the graphics and then add your animations to things that, that indicate relevant parts, or you've got to take some kind of source uh, image. And I just found this black and white football player guy. Um, and here's an entrance, you see the circle appears, and here's an exit, you see the circle disappearing. So uh, these are a couple of kind of categories, and I just wanted to show you some of the stuff that you can do. So if you're still wondering what the hell I'm talking about, you can do some, and, and surely you'll come up with some ways to make this more, uh, do, do other versions of this, but these are three sort of basic approaches, in my opinion. You can do sort of detailed technique position illustrations. You can talk about alignment, path, or box play illustrations. I, will, I have examples for you. And finally, it lends itself very well to these footwork illustrations. Uh, I would point out that this takes a deeper level of understanding than simply saying, here's some film of a guy doing it correctly. This means you as a coach have to understand it. Um, and if you can walk in on the field to show your, your players where the feet go and so forth, then you can probably build it on PowerPoint and you'll learn a lot in the process. I know that I have just messing with this stuff. So here's an example. This is showing a technique position thing. I illustrated these, I drew them just with shapes. Um, this is showing with a couple of arrows, showing the hands you're trying to punch into your opponent. You're trying to get the elbows locked out. There's your impact graphic, kind of cheesy, but it works. Now I'm showing that you're getting a straight arm and a bent arm, and I'm using some L, some arrows to show you this is the bent arm. You're posting and you're pulling. You're trying to turn your opponent. That's a fun one with a, a rotational reveal with a, a stock arrow. Again, you don't have to pull out a pencil and illustrate all the stuff. You just build them out of the shapes, the stock shapes in PowerPoint. And I know Kevin had a little bit of this stuff to share with us. It's not that different. Uh, as you go along, 
if you can imagine, I'm just copying and pasting each of these to show four, a progression through time of these four moments in time to show what your hands are trying to do in the process of a, of a punch. Yes, it looks a little budget, a little lo-fi, but I think it's pretty clear. You add some more stuff, which in my opinion, you do some real coaching. You add to the point, here's the, uh, your opponent's power line is coming at you. Once you've made impact with him and you start to uh, sort of deflect his blow off of, you, you bounce his power line to the side and you show that you might allow your player to do a little bit of a lateral slip to stay in their gap. Uh, those of you who've seen some of my presentations before have probably seen this slide. This, these are just the parts. This is to suggest that eventually once you've won this good position against your, the offensive lineman across from you, your eyes and your body are prepared to move into the backfield once you've handled this opponent. This is pretty simple stuff. I'll just run these animations again to show you. There's your punch. You're locking out. There's the impact. Straight arm, bent arm, turn this guy. Get yourself in a position where you're taking on his energy and you're bouncing it with a little bit of a lateral slip to turn him so that he isn't in a position where he's driving you back and now you're free to play football. So that's, this is what you can do when you work through simple technique or positional details. Here's some stuff about alignment and path. I won't go through it all, but I used just simple football player guys. That's a, an oval and a circle. Uh, I group that together. I copy and paste. I affect some of the transparency so you know that I'm paying attention to this guy, not the light pink guy. I use an arrow to say, this is the dude I'm talking about. If you get this block or that block, you can imagine how, how this might be quite useful if you're trying to play an end or train an end to understand a certain set of blocks. That, that's supposed to be my hard set. Uh, and of course, you can go inside. Now we're going to talk about a, a, a looser set for the same end. Now you can do things like say that that base block has got to cover more space, but now our, our gaps are starting to get stretched, but the reach block is far less effective. The down block, the kick out, now we get some more lateral stretch in those gaps. All this stuff is pretty straightforward. Once you have these basic shapes and know how to draw a line and animate them, which I will certainly show you. So this is an example of the way that you can diagram boxes. You can diagram relationships between the players in the box you show using arrows the path of your players and their alignments. Another, this is the second version of one of the things that I think PowerPoint and animated drawings will do well for you as a coach. Again, you probably have some even better ideas than mine. Draw some stunts and so on. This is the other one. Um, I sure wish when I played, I had coaches who would walk through footwork with me like this, but I never encountered them. Um, I just found online a couple of simple footprint uh, graphics and, and sort of tailored them for, for PowerPoint. And now you've got an opportunity to work through uh, the footwork progression for one player. And in this example, which I just borrowed from another uh, presentation, this is an example of dealing with a reach block. So what I'm doing is I'm saying, once the ball is snapped, your defensive player is picking up his hand and taking a small, hard read step. This is an animated movement, very simple. Meanwhile, I have to tell tell this player what to react to. So I've illustrated that open step from that offensive lineman. Very simple. It's an arrow and another foot with a wipe reveal. Again, I'll show you more of the stuff. My point here is to say that now we know that this offensive lineman is moving towards you. And with this bit of shading, I'm showing this is the gap as we understand it. And this guy is moving into it. He's challenging your position in the gap. So I just use this shade to suggest that the area, the space that you're trying to play as a defensive lineman. And I used another animation here to suggest this is how the block looks on paper. He's trying to horn block you, hook block you, reach block you, however you want to call it. But now I've got a very clear illustration of the block that this guy's trying to do. So now I can move on to talk about the footwork for this defender to deal with it. So one way to coach it, it's not the only way to coach it, but one way to coach it is to have your first real step be an open step. Your read, you're making a mirror step. So that's what this blue arrow is supposed to suggest that you mirror the step from the offensive lineman. Now we have a hard crossover step to get ourselves back into good position on the outside of this guy and a bunch of footwork to get ourselves back into a position where we can play this man and we have not given up our gap. I'm not here to argue about whether that's a good way to play the reach block. My point is that with a set of these little simple graphics, footprints and arrows, 
and a bit of animation. Again, my point is to show you this animation. It's very easy to show a, a player in this position how you want his feet to work in order to not get hooked when that reach block comes, if that even matters in the football that you coach. So that's the third version this, uh, of what PowerPoint might be good for. This is your footwork progression stuff. Um, uh, and this is one a bonus version I added last night, the last minute. Just a way to look a little further at box play. Use your arrows to suggest who you want to talk about, the gap you might be responsible for if an animated player like your end is playing outside. But if your end is playing inside, now you say you've exchanged gaps with him. And again, you can populate whole fields worth of players or just get in and tell me about the players in the box. Uh, pretty easy to, to imagine, I think, how taking a group of defensive linemen and linebackers, how this might be a useful thing to describe. You can do a far better job than I just did with this little thing, but it's um, this is an example of using some very minor movement animations and a couple of arrows to say, here's some details about a gap exchange that you might be looking at. So I'm gonna uh, try your patience. I'm gonna jump into here and, um, and actually try to illustrate with you here a couple of examples. So first thing I'm going to do is shrink my list of slides on the left so they don't need up a lot of space. The next thing I'm going to do is use this animation pane. So this is what I told you about before. Once I start to add animations, you'll see that they're listed here. Once they're listed, I have the opportunity to change them, adjust them, put them in different orders and affect exactly what animations I'm putting on there. So I got to move this because it's blocking my view of my own stuff. There we go. So we're going to try a couple of animations here just for fun. Make that paint a little smaller. So what am I going to do? I'm going to draw. We're going to imagine here we are talking to a group of football players and I want to highlight or indicate that I'm talking about a linebacker. I'll try to shade an area. I'll use an arrow to indicate where I want a given player's eyeballs to be at a certain moment. Um, maybe I'll point to somebody to show a key read or something that he's looking at. Um, then I'll show maybe an arrow to give us a, a look at a good and a bad pursuit angle. So bear with me and I'll try to show you how this stuff works. If you're ever unsure or feel like I've glossed over something a little too quickly, please give me a shout. I'm more than happy to stop. Um, it's very easy to assume people get it when you're trying to teach some stuff. So anyway, up here at the very top, there's an animations uh, tab and there's a bunch of them home and so forth. So I'm going to open and pin the animation tab so it's here. You'll notice all of these are grayed out. You cannot use animations until you've selected an object, okay? If I zoom in here, this object is simply three little ellipses. And I grouped the bunch together to make football players. I can copy those and make as many football players as I want. It's very simple. You can draw this stuff. They can be X's, O's, circles, whatever you like. Very, very straightforward stuff. Um, and here's the ones that I use to copy to bring them in here. So what am I supposed to do here? I'm trying to give us, oh man, this Zoom stuff gets the taskbar in your way. All right, I want to draw a circle to show a linebacker. Okay, so that's pretty easy. Somewhere up here, I've got to find my drawing tools. So uh, here they are on the top left. I keep the drawing tools here because it's a little easier. But since if I just go to format my drawing tools, there's a circle. The point I want to make is that you don't have to get everything right. Everything is really easily adjusted. Oh, I made that circle too big. Well, this, if I put this because I want to talk about the linebacker, now you realize that we can't even see the guy. So obviously the fill is not right. So if I right click it, I find the fill. I right click that. I'm going to say no fill. I'm also going to look at the line, which is what they call outline here. And I'll say, well, it, that isn't very impressive. I think the line should be red. So I really know that we're, this is an emphasis. And such a light line is not very impressive either. So let's look at the weight of that line and just beef it up a little bit. Okay. So at some point in this presentation, we're imagining I've got to show you some emphasis or emphasize this linebacker so that you know I'm talking about him. Uh, as far as the animations goes, it's as simple as this. I'm going to select it. I'm going to go to the animations and I'm going to pick one of these animations. There's a whole pile of them. Remember, we had entrances, emphasis, exit, and then the motion patch, paths, which is in fact the so-called uh, advanced animations. We'll talk about that too. But for now, I'm looking at my entrances. Let's just use, uh, for fun, a wheel reveal. So this is where, as we look at the way that we build this stuff, you go to your animation pane, and what I have here is a list. It says, 
Oval number two. For some reason, it's called this oval number two, probably because all of these are ovals. Um, and you get a little bit of information here. It's the first animation, and there's a little mouse to say that when the click happens during the presentation, not in this context, uh, once you get a click, the oval will show. Okay, so two ways to look at to see if you got it right. One is to go to the slideshow and say, start the, start the slideshow from this slide. That's one way to do it. The other is to use this preview. I like to use this piece right here, which is shift F5. Oops, fuck off, antivirus. Anyway, um, no. So the point here being, uh, let's see if we got this to work. Now I'm back into my presentation mode. If I press my mouse, this circle appears. That's all we've done so far. I'm gonna press escape and we're back to the edit page. So, so far so good. Uh, what's the next thing we want? We want to shade an area. Maybe we're gonna talk about a gap. So let's take a, a but jump back to my drawing tools. I'll grab a square and I'll say, this player we're interested in maybe that area. Oh, again, it, it defaults to a opaque filled space. So I'm just gonna go to the fill and I can choose a different color if I like. For now, I'm gonna go no fill. And just for simplicity's sake, I'll use a purple outline. And again, if you missed how I made a heavier line, I do that. So instead of shading an area, I'm just gonna show a box. And the, the idea would be, you might be trying to tell this linebacker that we're talking about that he's got some responsibility in here. I guess it would make more sense in the context of our conversation if we didn't have a D lineman in that gap. There we go. Pretty easy to move that stuff around. So now I need to animate that. So why don't we just go jump up to our animations, pick one, how about up here is always the easiest one. It will just snap into existence. Let's jump back to look at our presentation now. Again, I use Shift F5 or this little button that I put there. You can also use Preview. This is the other one you notice in the animation page at the far side is a Preview button. If I click the Preview button, it will in rapid fire show me all the animations that I put on the page. So I'll try. There's the first one, there's the second one. It doesn't care about my mouse clicks, it just puts them all in an order to see if they're happening in the right, in the right order. If you look here, I can select either one of these. So I go from the first oval back to the rectangle. I can change their order if I like, we'll do that in a minute. Now, the next thing that's actually quite important is the fact that you don't always want to animate an object and have it stay there. Because let's go to this presentation. I go, all right, everybody, we're talking about some defensive play. I wanna talk about this linebacker, great. And he's responsible, again, we're making this up as we go, but he's responsible for this gap. Good, now I wanna talk about the next point, but I've got all this junk in my way. So it's very valuable to know how to make things disappear when you're done emphasizing a given thing. A Little bit complicated, but also fairly simple. What I'm gonna do is select, and I can select an animation by either clicking the object, you see this turns red, or I can click it from the animation pane. You can see I've selected again. So I want the oval to disappear. I simply have to go into this little drop down here and look at the effect options. And I get this dialog box and it's a little hard to find some time, but it gives me a heading. It says that I have a wheel entrance. That's what the wheel means. And uh, now I'm looking at my after animation. Simply turn that to hide on next mouse click. And I'm gonna do the very same thing with this rectangle. You see, I selected it. I hit this box, effect options, after animation, Default is don't dim, meaning it stays on the screen. I want to hide it on the next mouse click. So I'm gonna, again, shift, shift F5 or jump back to this. Here's my examples. I'm gonna click my mouse once. Now you know that I'm talking about a linebacker. I'm gonna click my mouse again. The first thing disappeared and the second thing appeared. And I click my mouse a third time and the second object disappears. So hopefully that wasn't too tedious, but it's frequent that you need to have a uh, point of emphasis or an arrow or an object disappear when you're done talking about it. So far, so good. Add an arrow to indicate eyes. Great. So I'm going to go back up to my, um, where the hell is it? Uh, well, I'll do it the way that I like to do it, which is I work from here. Um, I use this little drop down thing that I put in recently. Uh, or again, you pop back to format and they're all right here. I, I like to have it right here because I don't want to bounce around quite as much. So I need to get I can use either a simple line with an arrow like this. These are called line arrows or connectors, or I, I think these block arrows are a little cooler. Again, you don't have to put it in the right 
place until you want it. I can move this object around. This little curly thing at the top lets you rotate. All right, I've made this way too big, no problem. I shrink it down, I grab it. Now I, I want that arrow to be looking at, I, I think it'd be cool to have it look at the back. How's my angle? Oh, it's still too long, pretty easy to fix that. So we're saying that I want this linebacker to take a look into the backfield for whatever reason, his eyes are in the backfield. Maybe this is gonna be a key or a read. Well, a key thing about these presentations, again, is if I go back to the actual presentation view, that arrow is already there because I have yet to animate it. So now I gotta animate it, that will make it appear. So why don't we use one of my favorites, which is a wipe. A wipe means it appears along an axis. And you see, one, now that I had it selected, I hit wipe, it's appeared on my animation pane, which means I can adjust it. An important detail about wipe and a couple of these directional animations is you have to choose the direction that you want it to wipe. So for this arrow to make sense, it should wipe up from the bottom. You can imagine if it revealed from the top, it would not make sense. Let's try that just for fun. This is, okay, we got that part right. Disappears, we got that part right. That doesn't make a lot of sense. The arrow wipe reveals in the wrong direction. I'm gonna hit escape, get myself back to my edit page, make sure that I have that arrow selected. I go over to my animation pane and I look up here and I go, yep, wipe is selected. The problem is that the direction of the effect is opposite what it should be. There I've selected from the bottom. When I go back to my presentation, hey, that's a sweet arrow. That's a great box, really tells me a lot of stuff. And obviously now my arrow works, all right? I think I probably want that arrow to disappear again. So I'll go back to effect options. In, after the animation, I would like it to hide on the next mouse click. That means when I advance through the animations with my next click, this will automatically disappear. So, so far we have three objects, three animations, they all disappear. And again, you can imagine yourself trying to explain. I'm talking about this linebacker. He's responsible for this area or it matters to him in some fashion. Maybe it's a gap, what have you. And I want his eyes here. Good. So now I want to have an arrow to show a key or a read. So that might be a movement. Um, I'm going to just go back to, why don't I do it this sort of easier way? Um, oh, I'll do it this way. Use my favorite way. I'm going to take a line and I'm going to just draw a line like this. Now you see, oh, I didn't use it. That was the wrong thing. I'm going to hit undo. I'm going to go back up here and grab an arrow and draw a line like this. Well, what I'm showing here is an arrow that is really skinny and weak. It doesn't, it doesn't quite have the weight of everything else. So I simply have to go to the outline again and tell it that I'd rather have a heavier weight. Six point, there's other ways to do it. You can format in a different way, but this is the simplest way. So now I've got an arrow. And because I like to color this stuff, I think what I'll do is so I'll pick a different color, red, because he's a big threat. So now you can imagine me saying to this linebacker, it's you, it's this area, your eyes are here. And if you get this boundary attack from this running back, for example, we're going to tell you to do certain things. In fact, you already know I'm going to talk about a good pursuit angle and a bad pursuit angle. So again, if I jump over to my presentation view, that angle is already there. From the point of view of me trying to teach this stuff to a player in particular, or another coach or a bystander, what have you, the arrow doesn't really make sense to be there from the beginning. So I'm going to animate it as well. So I'll hit animations, I'll use wipe. And I look at my effect options, and the default is up from the bottom, that would not work for a wipe animation for an arrow that needs to wipe in the direction that the arrow is pointing to make it make sense. So I'm going to use from the right side. Do I need this arrow to disappear for the sake of this presentation when it's done? No, because we're going to talk about what happens when he goes in this direction. Let's quickly jump back and look at what we have so far. This linebacker, that gap, his eyes are here, and there's our movement to the boundary. So now we're going to talk about his pursuit. One detail here I want to show you is that we can also affect the speed or the time that each of these animations take, and that's this little thing here. And if you get it to the right spot, you can see that it starts at zero seconds and it ends at 0.5 seconds. What that means is that it's going to do the full animation in a half of a second. So if I bring my cursor right to the edge and drag that, you can see, you just pick a number, let's say about three seconds. If I jump back to my animations here, 
now I have a three second animation to show that. And if you imagine yourself in the at the pulpit talking to your your flock, maybe you want to use that as a way to uh, sort of big up the moment that you're trying to drive out here. So now, what's the next thing I have to do? I want to show an arrow to show a bad pursuit angle, and I want to show an arrow to show a good path. Well, I'm not going to stress this too much, but I'm going to use one of these wiggly lines to show good and bad paths. So I think you would agree that if you've got a, um, a back to the boundary, you probably don't want to just start by running or laterally. You probably want to have a more aggressive angle. Fine. At this point, we're just showing that a bad version. So what I what I realized is for the sake of this presentation, I may want to have the two lines basically have be the same thing. So what I'm going to do is is change this line to be heavy enough, the right color with the right animation, and then I'm just going to copy it so that the next line is already done. So what do we want to change about this line? First of all, it's obviously far too small. So I go to outline, I go to weight, and I'll just make it a heavier line. Well, do I like the color? Well, right now I'm talking about the bad version. So maybe we'll call it red. When I show you the good version, I'll change the color. Okay, so what do I want this line to do? I wanna reveal the line in a way that makes it look like the player's moving it through the field. That makes some sense. So I'll go back to my animations and I'm just gonna use wipe again. And I'm gonna wipe from the bottom because that will make it look like he's running into the backfield. And again, I'm trying to illustrate the wrong thing. and I know that I also probably want it to disappear when it's done so that we aren't looking at the bad version. Again, I'll just tell it to hide on the next mouse click. Okay, so you see now my animation pane is filling in here. And I now I can just copy this. I can simply, I'm gonna use my control, hold control and just drag copy like that. I can also go control C and control V gives me paste. I can go through up here and go copy, paste, so on. So, or I can put them all up here on my little own personalized taskbar. So you'll see, let's just jump and do it this way. You've seen all this stuff already. There he is with a three second run to the boundary. So I have this twice. Okay. Pretty good so far. The thing is this, this one here, actually, I'm going to do this wrong. This one I want to change and I want to be a different color. I'm going to make this green because this is going to end up being the good version. All right. Now, as I say, these are objects. These are simply lines and connectors that I can change. So let's say, even though that's probably also a pretty lousy pursuit angle, let's just use this for the sake of uh, sake of argument, if you will. And here's the bad version, which I just put in the right place. So my point here is, uh, there's a couple parts here. One is to show you that I simply copied all the animation, all the details, and now I have two lines that I can use. The other thing I wanna point out is that I intentionally put them in the wrong order. Let's take a quick look at that. Here's our slow thing. And now I'm trying to say, this is what you do not want to do. Oops, but the thing that you do want to do came up first. All right, I'm going to hit escape. We're going to pop back. And you notice here on the animation pane, I can just take the one that is in the wrong position and drag it up. You can see the line appears underneath. And now we're in the right order. We've seen all this a dozen times. Here's our very slow attack to the boundary. Now I'm going to talk about the wrong way to pursue that. I do not want lateral steps. I don't want false steps. I don't want you flowing sideways to the boundary. I want you attacking upfield. I probably don't want that line either, but it's better than the lateral shuffle stuff. So unless there are any questions at this stage, which I think I think this is a pretty decent job of just, just sort of showing you what you can do with this and, and the way you might uh, use this in a presentation. Anybody have any questions at this stage? Do you want me to add anything, take anything away? I think we're good, Gabe. Any anybody have any questions? Beautiful. I got a couple more things to share, and then I'll uh, then you can see if you can stump me. All right, I'm going to jump back into our presentation. We'll run through this one more time. Here's the linebacker I want to talk about. He's a really in a tough position because we ask him to do this. We put his eyes here, and when he gets this key to the boundary, we cannot make this mistake. We've got to do this. Pretty simple way to to present. I think if you were a player trying to learn this stuff, it'd feel pretty immediate, tactile, obvious. As I click along through the presentation, I get to this next one. Here's an example that I think is actually quite useful about what you can do with these animations. And it's always a challenge to design drills and to share drills with other coaches and to show people what you're trying to talk about. 
these animations give you a chance, partly because there's a very, very simple, repeatable way that you can borrow from the previous drill. You can build progressions on your drill. You just have to lay out the parts. Okay, so here's a set of cones. Here's a scale that shows you that you're gonna set up the cone. So for this drill, I've got some gates set up. Here's a, here's a player uh, or a rabbit at the top gate, the black dot is your coach. I've shown some extra players. I've shown players in a line. And then I animate the parts so that maybe in meetings to make sure that things move quickly on the field, I install the drill. Always great to install drills before you get on the field. Maybe you just get the coaches together and go, here's the drill I want to run. I need you here. I need you there. Uh, as you work through it, whether this information is for your players to install a drill or for your coaches to install a drill or for you to share with other coaches the way you like to do what it is. This is a basic pursuit leverage drill. Uh, you put all the details, you can animate the text. You can see I have text appearing to describe how the drill works. And then I animate a bunch of arrows to show that everybody's moving at the same time. This guy's trying to get over and around. So he's playing outside in leverage. This guy's inside out leverage. The ball carrier is supposed to do this for the sake of the drill. And as you go along, you talk about variations and you talk about how you want, for example, your rabbit or your ball carrier to stress or fool your defenders to get the most out of the drill. You can imagine if you were a position coach or a casual coach and your head coach or your DC or OC sits you down and says, here's the drill we're running today. You spend three minutes with this. You go, great, I can help on this drill. I'm sure you've all been in a position before where you're sort of helping out and you don't quite know the drill and you'd love to be involved, but you don't really know what we're coaching. You don't really know what's going on. A couple kids surely don't, aren't getting it either and you don't know what to say because you don't know the drill. Well, hey, if you've seen this, again, two or three minutes, a little bit of lead work as a coach, and you can teach drills very easily with this simple animated graphic format. Another version, I think this might be my last example. I used this a while ago. This is a general team pursuit drill. I'm saying you set up a box, you put your defense in place, you as a coach walks to the boundary and you call it up each position with how you designed your pursuit, your team pursuit. And you're call, you've got names for all these things. You've got ways to coach all the details. You're asking force, you're asking overlap, fence, all whatever, however you want to do this deep, deep pursuit. Um, you can you can obviously use this kind of uh, technology to teach this in meetings so the kids can see it. Um, a drawing on the chalkboard might work very well or the whiteboard, but this is a, a fun way to do it as well. And if you want to bother to animate all this stuff so that they actually wipe or move or fly in, you get a little bit extra cool points. Um, so here's a quick recap and I'll pass the mic. It, this program is cheap, available, use it as an archive, build your master document, um, this is a pretty impressive thing. And again, I was complimenting JP on it. I think before he got here, his, uh, his Ravens playbook is really, really impressive. All the stuff he's got, treating this as an archive, treating it as a graphics program. It's very simple, very easy to turn into usable uh, handouts, uh, printouts, whatever, presentations, whatever. My point here is take that document, turn it into cards, whatever you need to do, repeat it season in, season out. And then we get into the other half of PowerPoint, which is your ability to animate objects, illustrations, stills, film, whatever. Use this as a teaching tool. I'm only scratching the surface. You may find, think of a million ways to do a better job of this stuff. But hopefully after this, you have a basic sense of how to fly, make arrows fly around, how to make little di diagrams or their little, little circles, X's, O's, whatever, skim them around. I didn't get into the movement stuff. It's a little more complicated, but I'd be happy to show it to you now if you're interested. Um, but that's it. You can email if me if you've got any questions. Be happy to spend some time on Zoom with you. Um, but that's all I got. Please ask any questions if you're interested. Um, I'd be happy to, to go over some of the stuff and thanks for the time. If you have any questions, guys, just go ahead and unmute yourselves and, uh, and ask away. That was awesome, Gabe. Thanks for putting that together. Thank you, Sharps. Gabe, just wondering, did you play around with the defaults at all with your, uh, like when inserting uh, uh, pictures, inserting shapes, that type of thing? I, I realized that it was possible. I haven't gone through it. Um, I know that you and uh, JP and, um, and a number of guys from that part of the province know this stuff better than me. Maybe you should, you should tell us how to do the default stuff. I know you can change it. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, I have not bothered to. 
Yeah, I just know that because uh, one of the things like whenever you put in a shape, it always comes up with a really thin borderline and it always comes up shaded, like filled in. Right. So you're constantly clicking like no fill and changing the border to three That's point right. or whatever. To be honest, if, so whatever document you're doing, I'm pretty sure it's still the same. Whatever that first shape you put in, you take the fill out, you make the, the point longer, uh, uh, sorry, bigger, like a three point line around the outside. Then you can just right click and put set as default and all of your other shapes you put in will come up with no fill and a thicker border. Let's try that. So I think so if you, you were saying, shape and do that, I'm pretty I sure. I just wanted to say, say I go no fill. There we go. And let's just say I want the outline to be heavier. Yeah. Just for fun. Now I'm going to right click it. Now you should be able to right click and set have set as, as default. default. Shape. Yeah. I think I got it set as default shape. So now if I go to a shape, I'm in animations. Go to that. Why can I not get out of this? There we go. So if I get, there we go. Very simple. So that's great, buddy. I like yeah. that, Chris. It's just because so it instead get, of having to take every one. Yeah, it gets tedious after a while. So now it's set that as the default, and then it becomes a lot quicker. What I've done is a, as a as a poor man's way to do that is simply make the one shape I need, and then always just keep copying off of it. Yeah. So that, that I know everything work, on the screen is the same size. You know. So I think Gabe, that should work. Like if you put in a square right now, it would also come up with no border, or sorry, no fill and a thicker border. I think that should work. Hey, you're right. Yeah. You're, you're bang on. So do you want to uh, do a presentation for us, Chris? Because I'm, I'm learning stuff already. No, no. Just one of those little These tricks. masters of PowerPoint. You should see what JP does. Yeah, that's brilliant, man. Hey, Chris, was that is that only going to be in that one file or is that? Yes. Yeah, so I think it'll be in that one document. So you have to do it at the beginning of every new document. I'm pretty sure. I don't know how to set the default for your whole program differently, but I know you can do it in each document. Any PowerPoint wizards out there, uh, feel free to chime in. JP is a grand wizard. I'm sure he knows all this stuff. Yeah, from what I know, you uh, you cannot preset outside of getting in like coding of PowerPoint. Uh, I don't think you can preset like the, the default shape uh, when you start a new document, I think. Yeah, no, One thing I know you can do is simply build a template document. And if you work everything you do out of that template, once you've set it, you just open the template, save as, once you've made all your changes, and then everything you ever want is the same coming out of that. You just have to not save onto your original template as per normal, you know, uh, computer work. Yeah, and when, when... The way I've done a lot of the building of, you know, um, blitzes and all that stuff, you know, you set up your first template that has your your six boxes and stuff um so that's you know that's how a lot of guys have done it for a long time so that's a that's a good thing to know now that because you always deal with that blue box when it shows up every time yeah the other thing gabe i don't know if you have but have you like if you have you opened your clipboard after you've copied a bunch of things yeah i have um i i tend not to because back when I learned computers, you had one thing on the clipboard. <laughs> and I know this is a big, uh, a big improvement. So you can copy a lot of things and they'll stack in here. So I could copy this guy. And now I've got him sitting there. Maybe I want this text box. Um, there it is. So what the point uh, Chris is saying here is I might, I might at some point later in another document go, oh, I want to drop this in somehow. And you can see that it's actually popped in there. I'll drop that in. There it is. Um, another nice thing, it took me a little while to figure it out, is if I if I look at my archive here or my uh, list of slides, I'm just going to duplicate this one. If I were to say, you know, want I want to change this to say uh, heading number three, if I simply take that box or graphic or whatever and copy it, when I jump to the next uh, slide, and just press paste, it'll be in the same spot. I didn't illustrate that well, but if I added yet another slide, got rid of all this stuff. Uh, so the point being, say, I'll do it this way. 
If I just like that arrow to be in a certain place, I'll copy it. I can go to the next slide, paste, next slide. You'll see they all end up in the precisely the same spot on every slide. So sometimes you want to do that with like a whole set or, or a formation or whatever. And it's really straightforward to just stamp those out on a bunch of slides. If for some reason you don't want to just duplicate the entire slide, it's a very handy thing to do as well. So yeah, any other uh, tips? I'm, I feel like I'm the student. This is great. And Gabe, you had a question about the, uh, the footprint, where you ended up finding that. Uh, I'll share it with you, but it was, I find uh, you can find a lot of pretty good um, stuff like that. Cause often you want something very simple, like a black and white line drawing. I can't seem to find what I did. Uh, and those are generally, you find them in the, uh, what you call the sort of clip art world. So if you look in Google images, for example, you, if you type in clip art, footprint, black and white, you'll get dozens of things. Um, and a funny thing there is if you look for, it looks like a, a shaded checkerboard in the background. When you grab graphics in that context, what's kind of valuable there is if it's got that shaded checkerboard, it means that it's got a, a perimeter where, how do I say this? There's no white space. It can be dropped in without blocking, if you follow me. Um, so if, you know, let me use this as an example. Here I have a, 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 a graphic, this guy, and there's a white space around him that if I had moved that to the front, um, there's various ways to do that. Uh, it would cover up other parts of my graphics. If you get a clip art thing that's got that shaded checkerboard around the outside, there's no white space there. So the item will stand alone in the space and you'll see the background behind it. Instead of what I have here, as you can see, I have a, um, I actually have this white blank area around the graphic, which is not always what you want. So when you're looking for things like those footprints, try to find the ones with that shaded background. It's often called transparent too, uh, Gabe. So when you do a That's search the for- the key, yeah, thank you, Jeff. You just tag that uh, word to your search. And uh, for example, uh, footprint, transparent, transparent footprint, and you might have that checkerboard in the back of the image where it's just the footprint shape itself. So the footprint I found, you can see, uh, doesn't have that white space around it. So, and I only found one of these and I'll give you the file if you want. Um, one thing it took me a little while to figure out is, uh, first of all, this is obvious, you can rotate things, but I kept going, why can't I flip this? Cause I, I need a left foot. What the hell, it, this is really annoying. If you use the scale thing like this to change the size, you can invert it in any direction. Uh, the corners will give you size changes and the middle buttons will let you flip it. Um, again, took me an embarrassing amount of time to figure that out. All right, I don't wanna take any, much, any more time unless people are, uh, have some questions or, or more really valuable input. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll pass the mic. That was awesome. Yeah, if you can, um, if you wanna just put the footprint in, uh the chat there's a file share deal um oh yeah okay i'll stop sharing and try to do that right now yeah that would be awesome um and, and um any code like gabe how long have you been using powerpoint for uh well whenever rick started doing these uh presentations a couple weeks later um somebody asked jp and those guys what you use for for your playbook structure and they just said powerpoint there's a ton of things we can do uh, I thought, great, I'll try to learn this thing and was pretty quickly, I could do some things, but really it took me a few months to get the animations to work. Um, and now I feel pretty fluent with it. And, and I'd still, I'm sure I, there's a ton of stuff I haven't figured out yet. Sharbs, I got the, uh, the file share. It's, I just have Dropbox, OneDrive, Google Drive, et cetera. What am I doing here? Just your computer? Uh, no, it, let me just see here. Um... Yeah, I can't paste it, it seems. Oh, really? Yeah, just under under chat, there's just the file. Um, if you can email it to me too, Gabe. Yeah. Uh, Co Coach Barise wants it, so I could forward it to him there if he's know. interested. If anybody else sure. wants well, it, just let me know. I'll sign off here so I'm not taking up any more time, and I'll, I'll just drop into an email, a left and a right of that footprint, and I'll send it to Rick. And I guess send Rick a text if you want a, if you want a copy. That's awesome. Thanks, that, Gabe. I'll... Uh, Sorry, go ahead, Rick. 
Well, I was just going to say thanks, Gabe, because I think I think the valuable part of this is as we some of our coaches are coaching younger kids. I think this is going to be a neat tool, as you said, right? That you know, even as when Jeff and I get back to high school and stuff, and Brian doing some of this younger touch stuff, you know, you can build some of those things, like you say, and you can also just give it to it. Like you can have this somewhere, right? Brian can put this on the KMFL website that you know, parents and kids can go and look, what's a pursuit drill, right? And, and as you say, if uh, I know Coach uh, Coach Brennan mentioned that he had some time with COVID to actually rebuild some files and stuff that he's got. And obviously the U-level sports have a lot more film, which is always a great thing. But as some of these teaching aids, it is really cool to have that ability to, to just teach some basic concepts, right? As we say, what is pursuit? That whole pursuit drill you drew up, I think is pretty cool for parents as well, right? As we, as we have to reintroduce this sport to a whole new generation. So. Yeah, I think awesome. it's, it's pretty cool how you went from finding out about how to, you know, that PowerPoint was a, a, a tool you could use as a coach and you've taught yourself how to do this. And just in this one off season, well, it's a big, long off season, but just very you know, long yeah. in the last uh, four or five months. So uh, that's been awesome that you've been able to teach yourself that. And that was great that you put that together and showed the guys. Um, hey, Sharp, don't, don't, don't. Don't forget, Gabe has an art degree from U of T. So not every guy could just jump in and do that like Gabe. Like Gabe, he's a little bit above the rest of us with that degree. Right, Gabe? It's so true, Rick. So true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that was awesome. Thanks a lot for doing that. Yeah, thanks, guys. All righty. So as we're uh, early on in the wintertime, we had some questions regarding how to defeat pressure. And uh, JP and I have been sitting on this one for a while as, uh, as we've had a lot of other presenters, but uh, always quick when I texted him a couple weeks ago to come back into the bullpen here is uh, JP Aslan uh, is going to um, take us through some screenplay. So JP and I didn't finalize all the details. So it's going to be a bit of a bit of a surprise for me, but I think uh, he's uh, anybody that's followed along with us all this winter knows what a great teacher and presenter he is. So JP will, uh, will give you the floor. I think you can screen share as well if you need to. Yeah, thanks. And uh, thanks to Gabe. I feel like doing a presentation on doing PowerPoints live in front of us, no pressure. I thought that was great, man. And uh, I know a lot, I feel like, but like even some of the animation stuff, I, I haven't done that many animations. So I thought it was great. And thanks a lot. Um, I hope my internet stay good. I moved here because my internet, I think, is better. I had some technical difficulty tonight, uh, but I think it's good here. And uh, to uh, Rick's point, in terms of screen, I, uh, I presented like on a receiver screen early on, like a little hitch by the receiver. So I was going to build on that a little bit and show you a bunch of different variation and like, try to go through maybe like I think it's five or six different screen and then maybe two or three plays off of that also that are not screen and I've asked Chris Colson actually to uh, help me out here and uh, kind of talk more about the tailback screen um, so he'll he'll uh, he'll jump in as well and present so uh, sorry for you guys you're gonna have to listen to Chris a little bit later but we should uh should be all right. All right, I'll share my screen. Just a little recap. Actually, okay. I'll take a second and just show a little bit. This is something I've um, gonna stop. I'm gonna stop my camera because I feel like that might help my internet. Um, this is something that I've uh, that I showed last time. So this is just a, a little hitch by the whiteout where there's no O-line involvement, right? And then we're teaching, I don't know if you can see if it's too small, but MDM, where it says MDM, it's uh, most dangerous man between the corner and the half. Some of the big coaching point was that this receiver is going to uh, be on the line of scrimmage catching this ball. So he's going to take three hard steps up the field, back on the line of scrimmage. When the quarterback, if a right-handed quarterback is throwing to his left and it's the weak side, he's actually not even going to move his right foot. He's going to catch and throw. Um, and then the big coaching point on this, to make this as successful, I feel like we've ran this, was often when it's man-to-man -man or equal, MDM is going to become the corner. And if you've watched that presentation, we have, because of the angle we're coming from, we often end up on the inside shoulder at first of the corner. And when this receiver catches the ball, number one, he's going to attack inside, like following a normal block. 
but both of those receivers know that the block is going to try to reach then the outside shoulder and we're going to bounce this thing on the sideline. And we had went through like, I think six or seven variation of this plays where both those receivers are off the line, where the slot back is off on the line and the wide out is off where um, we had variation where they're stack. Um, and, you know, I'm going to show, I'm going to flip to, let me know if you can, you can see this uh, PowerPoint right now, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. And I'm going to try to see if I have to, um, and now can you see film yeah we got carlton in red jerseys on right now perfect okay so i don't have to go back and forth like said the share screen so at the top here of the screen you'll have um oh sorry at the bottom so we're to the field so it's a right-handed quarterback but because this throw is longer we're going to let him kind of shuffle and set his feet because it's a longer throw. We still want accuracy. So from the wideout, we had talked about one, two, three hard step. They don't need to be as long as those steps, but he's catching this ball right on the line of scrimmage. We have the slot back coming to block the corner. He's lower. And one thing I didn't mention, we talked to him about like getting, trying to split those two for the first two, three yards. So in a position that he can react to both. Like we don't want him to make his decision now on who's most dangerous. We're going to let him get two, three yards up the field, split those two defenders, and later kind of react. So sometimes as, like this defender could be very slow playing like a hitch wheel, and this player, when he sees him coming to block, could be very aggressive. So we want him to be patient. And then, like I think I showed a lot of clips last time, we end up outside the corner. And to the field, realistically, that could be a bigger plays than this, than 10 yards. I'll show a couple of clips of this and then go to the next one. So we have motions. We're going to end up with three receivers to the boundary and still go to number one week. And now we're blocking the half from the number two. He's trying to just create a wall here. And we're going to have a one-on-one -on -one in space with the corner trying to make a miss. But that corner is kind of, you can see, not too aggressive, scared to miss a tackle. And, and we end up still on first and 10, getting 10 yards. So... You know, against pressure, obviously, kind of a nice way to just get rid of the ball quickly and kind of, you know, create a run play uh, out of a quick pass play. I'll just show this quickly. Um, you can uh, – we're back on the, the uh, PowerPoint. I'm switching back to my iPad to be able to draw on it. So – so this is the same play just from the number two receiver is now running the hitch and the outside receivers is MDM. He's blocking the corner or the half. We see a lot of team that, you know, mostly like even sometime on second and long, if they want to play with a very soft half, like he's almost a free safety, it's great to throw the ball right to number two in front of a really soft defender. And often when we see that, we see the will that expand. And, um, one play that we really like with this inside receiver out of two receiver set running the hitch um, is a, I guess you would, some, we, I don't know if you'd call it an RPO. We call this a look. So a quarterback would look and decide what he would want to do. So this would be basically an old schooled ISO play where the tailback downhill, full back through the B gap if he can, and hitting the wheel landbacker. If, we have a low half here. We would probably just give the ball and it was just running ISO. If um, this half is playing soft, it's cut coverage. We know the will wants to be in between and the quarterback is now going to just take a quick look at the will, but with the action of the tailback downhill, that might affect the will for a second and quarterback now just throws the hitch. If the will wants to literally in, cut line up almost in front of number two then we're just going to give iso but it was a nice and i i i wanted to talk about it because i don't have film unfortunately of this variation but i have a couple clips um of showing you the inside receiver what that would look like jp can you before you share your video can you go back out and just optimize because right now it's a little bit choppy 
fucking thanks. It's weird, like I see the optimized video clip, but it doesn't let me select it. If I have put my camera, does it change anything? Yeah, it doesn't let me select. Oh, oh, I got it. I just changed it. You should be good now. Ah, that was your fault? <laughs> yes, I guess. <laughs> 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 okay. I want to see the place, sorry. All right. All right. So what I thought I wanted to show you because there's a couple of cool things we can do. The the one I showed you on the um on the PowerPoint. Uh, oops, my bad. You cannot, uh, I don't have the film. Uh, yeah, I won't show you, but like all the hitch wheel stuff we had talked about, I have in this cut up as well. Um, I'm not going to go through that now. So you can do some neat things here with the, uh, with number two on the hitch. Um, so we have four receivers to one side here and we're running basically an outside zone play to the close formation side. And we have just our quarterback reading number of defender. So we're running a little hitch because number one here out of four receivers a bit far. So we're giving him to this receiver. He's running the hitch, but our quarterback is making a decision to either give it to the tailback if they thin out the boundary or to throw this receiver if uh, if we only have, let's say, three on four. So in this first clip, I believe we give the ball to the tailback, which is the right direction. But you can see to the field, those receivers are still running the number two hitch. And I'll show you the next play. I think it's the same. I thought it was the same play. Well, we're in three, one, but it's the same idea. And now we're going to throw the number two receiver. Maybe not the right decision. It's okay. We're three on three. So we don't have a big, big advantage. But so one of the things we talked about when we're off the line of scrimmage, so we actually took on this play, this is our, our an all-star punt returner. That's a DB. So this is a playoff game. We just put it in for two plays, I think. He went to number two. So he doesn't know all the details. We're just throwing the ball to our best athlete. This is a DB playing number two. But one of the things we had talked about, if you're running the hitch when you're off the line of scrimmage, we still want to catch the ball on the line of scrimmage. But instead of passing the line of scrimmage and coming back, we'll just get caught in the backfield on the snap, go to the line of scrimmage, and still catch it on the line of scrimmage. So what he does wrong here is that he sits in our backfield, right, basically. So for the first four yards that he gains just getting back to the line of scrimmage instead of catching it on the line of scrimmage. So and from <clears> – <throat> I have a good clip here of our, our number one receivers trying to figure out MDM not assuming who that is. Now he locks on the corner and he knows he would want to get the outside shoulder if he can. He missed a little bit, but he's always working for that outside shoulder. So again, those two are the same play, just a different receivers running it, right? So just the number two receivers like to run it out of four receivers. So we did a lot of stuff out of four, one, with scissors concepts, bunch of other things, but this is a nice little cheap play, mostly when you have other options to throw and they don't cover down with four low defenders. That's kind of hard to do. So give you an advantage on first down. So here we're doing a motion again to four one and they're late to move, right? So it's really hard to put four low defender in front of that screen. And it's just a little cheap play extending your, your running game we're still teaching the same thing to always reach for the outside shoulder of the defenders we're trying to block. So even though, and you know, we're setting ourselves up here where the, the ball carrier is inside of him and we have him getting inside. And that, that's a lot of, I remember when Gabe presented on, on fits, uh, you know, in space like that, that's a lot of work for the defense to adjust to all those looks. 
here's a little different. So what we're doing here, so we're playing a team that likes to play what I would say like a light and a, or a heavy box, you know, really quickly. So those two always try to be like half in the box, half cover guy. You never know, are they DBs or are they box player? So what we've done here, we've moved those people outside the numbers on both sides and get those people to declare. So he stays, and now we're way out here, and we're really going to have two easy block and the number two receiver. So this is a receiver, so he does it better in terms of timing. You can see he's way in the backfield on the snap, and he ends up catching the ball right on the line of scrimmage. I believe his knee was down, and we didn't get called. But just taking advantage of um, space, and you're just throwing like at the line of scrimmage. like It's literally a zero-yard zero pass, right? So pretty cheap. Again, with motion, receiver moving, four receivers in front. I think I had one more bit different look. All right. So we're still going outside. So at the top of the screen, even though it's the half, you can see the fight for outside shoulder, outside shoulder. And that's a great job by a ball carrier attacking inside, setting up his block, and those two work together he knows he's going to work with the outside shoulder and he's going to bounce this thing. And that's, that's second and 10, and we're still calling this. So a lot of options there. All right. Next. Okay, so next play is our bubble screen that uh, I feel like we coach a little bit differently. Um, so I'm not sure if now the PowerPoint is a bit, uh, because I optimized the video, so it might be a little uh, not as clear, but uh, you can see like how, uh, I know I've coached with Coach Breezy in the States, and if you if you coach this in the States, this is going to be the number three receivers now running that, what, we, what people would call bubble screen. We kind of hate the term because we don't want this receiver to bubble. So what I mean is if you're in the States, this receiver is going to be two, three yards behind the line of scrimmage, like a you know static receiver. And he's going to have to bubble back to be able to catch this screen. But we play in Canada, so we can be you know, 10, 15 yards behind the quarterback through the cadence. And this little line that goes across on here means where we are on the snap of the ball. So we're at the quarterback's depth or a yard behind, and we're going to take one step forward and then sprint to the sideline parallel to the line of scrimmage and then look our, on our inside shoulder, obviously. But one thing that we realize is this throw is not easy because if the receiver is running and we put the ball just on his back hip and the receiver needs to turn around, this play is not as effective at all. So we need a ball that's very accurate. Can you guys still hear me? Sorry. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, you're still good, JP. Yeah, sorry, my computer froze. It's weird. Okay, sorry about that. Um, all right, so we were trying to make this throw as easy as possible for a quarterback. And basically what we're teaching the quarterback is flipping his hip if it's to the right. And if the receiver is running parallel to the line of scrimmage, he's just throwing the ball a yard, a yard and a half in front of him and let the receiver go get it. But it gives him a very accurate point to the quarterback of where he needs to put the ball. Receivers is stay on that line and you put the ball a yard, a yard and a half in front of him. When the receivers start doing this, it's really hard for the quarterback to know where to put the ball. Like the angle that the receiver takes to attack back the line of scrimmage changed so much for where you need to put the ball, both how far it needs to be from the line of scrimmage, like this way, and how far it needs to be towards the sideline, just based on the angle that you would take if you're teaching these receivers to actually bubble. So you'll see on film, this receiver is just printing out. And again, when we're trying to throw this, the SAM is somewhere, you know, 
close to the box. Maybe he's obviously not outside shade or we have numbers. But one thing that we tell this receiver is you should be able to outrun this Sam. So obviously, if you want to outrun this Sam, let's say to this point, you know, doing this big bubble doesn't help you run that rate, win that race. So we're going straight. And then for a blocking, we're still teaching MDM. Sometimes you might see even a double team on a halfback if they have huge contours and hold. And then that receiver is coming off later. And we're going to teach the same thing about working for the outside shoulder. And then on this one, I'll show you, I'll show you film of this. And then I'll show you uh, some example of plays that goes off of that as well that are not screened. And this is the last receiver screen I'll show you. And we'll get into some uh, O-line involvement. So this call, we got called for holding on this, which, you know, you're an offensive guy, so you think, uh, I think that's BS call, obviously. We're going to see this receiver. He's going to come straight towards the sideline as much as possible. When he turns his head, he will lean back towards the line of scrimmage a little bit. But the biggest thing is we have an accurate point from the quarterback point of view to throw the ball. What I don't like from the quarterback here, I don't like him going back. He knows he's going there. He could just shuffle and throw or set his feet and throw, but not go backward. Because we, we obviously, like, we're, we're limit, right? We're trying to make those two on the same level and throw a yard, a yard and a half in front so we know it's a forward pass. But we're always, we're pretty close to a, a lateral always. And then I thought that was, like, to be honest, like, I don't know, maybe some defensive guys can uh, – can see what they think, but I thought that was amazing job here. Obviously, big pressure, right, uh, from uh, McMaster here. Uh, bring cover zero pressure, plus one pressure, and I like this call against it. Again, we need to run away from him, but those two blocks starting inside out, but you're going to see how we work for the outside shoulder, create space, and end up winning those two blocks. And it's really once we've passed the number two receivers, that, you know, that's the holding call that this referee ended up calling. But a nice, it, it, it's not the easiest throw you would think, but it doesn't need a strong arm, that's for sure. And we've practiced this throw a lot, pre-practice. And that's something our receivers quarterback do a lot. I would want this number three receivers to come maybe at the quarterback's depth, take one more step forward before he starts running, sprinting to the sideline. But we're leaning the receivers towards the line of scrimmage, and he can hit it with speed. Again, our number one receiver winning the outside shoulder, and that becomes a way, way bigger play. Now, we didn't get call on this, and that's probably more holding than the previous play. But yeah, You got robbed on that other one, JP. Yeah. The defensive guys would agree? or <laughs> So... Now this is out of four receivers. Uh, one of the things that you'll see is you're like, I don't know if you've noticed that our number four receiver is, is, is too wide to my liking. But one of the things that we teach, our, whoever's running that screen, the most inside receiver, basically number three or number four, we want him to line up in a really wide. Right? So we want him to be in a positive alignment, we say towards the sideline as he breaks the huddle. Why? Because we want to see if a Sam or someone is running out of the box with him. Right? Line up wide so our quarterback can pre-snap, make the read if he wants to throw to you. Now, once he's made that read and attacked the line of scrimmage, I would want him to get a little bit close, maybe not as close as this line does it, but a little bit closer to the quarterback so we're not end up throwing you know, too far for no reason. So he's a little bit far. We still get the throw there, but nice little play with you know, only three guys there two guys low to the field with three blockers and we end up with a nice play. So we can do it out of four receivers. Again, for our quarterbacks, if he's throwing to his left, he's just going to set his feet and throw. If he's throwing to his right, he's going to flip and throw. So I think we get the, the idea. So this, I, we're behind the, the quarterback, right? So that's not what we want. We need to be at the level of the quarterback before we start working to the sideline because that's technically if we drop this, that's a lateral. In early, we uh, used to be able to cut. So even in new sports, I believe now that's illegal. But 
you know, when a corner is, was that aggressive, we, we don't want to cut actually on receiver screen. That's not what we would want. But it's just that if they're sprinting at us, then obviously like trying to like, you know, stay up at times was pretty hard. So we, we would go and cut them if they want to be that aggressive. I think that was the last one. And then show you the play that goes off of that. I think it starts here. Nope. So now, just like uh, when we show the screen, like with the, the hitch, we had the hitch wheel and we had the read, if you saw that presentation. Here, actually, I can switch to this and show you the slide, what we're trying to do. Uh, that's with a running back that we can do the same thing. Here's with the receiver. So um, you can see how that looks the same. Just a little detail of coaching this. So we're going to have the most inside receiver run that screen. And we're just going to go sit behind him. And, and all what we did is for this number two receivers, that star meant like a double move. So meaning he would stutter his feet a little bit, show like as if he wants to stock block him. And he's reading him a little bit. If, if this person is like the most disciplined DB we've ever seen of our life, and he's playing man, and his eyes are staring only at us, and he does not want to make the play on the bubble, we'll end up running a true slant. Like if he's on us, we start to, and we start moving towards a slant, and he's on us, we, we keep moving. I would say that would happen maybe once out of a hundred times you're running this play. You know, one of the big challenge when you actually are throwing the bubble screen is to block the half in the cone. They see the bubble, they see a quarterback look here, and they're downhill, and they're going to go make the play for a two-yard gain. Help those two receivers by having something off of it. And now I stutter my feet. We have the bubble scream. He screams down. There's going to be a Sam or a Mike coming here. So we're just turning around. And that, I don't know if it's too small, but you can see like there's some little waggly line within that slant. That's because he's sitting, you know, 99% of the time. So we're just looking to stutter our feet. Halfback leaves us. We take that space, basically, and we don't move. Same thing on the outside. So very simple concept again. And that can lead to, to big plays for sure. Uh, I think as you'll see on film at times. So this receiver stutter his feet. He's coming down. And he's just going to turn around and take that space. For the quarterback, we taught a bit different steps here. So um, we started like this is early on. He's just looking at that bubble and throwing. What we played with that worked well for our timing, what he's actually going to you know, he's a right-handed quarterback. He's actually going to take a two-step drop, basically. So he's going to, he would step with his, um, with his left foot first as a real one and right foot as a second step and then throw. So while he's taking that first step with that left foot, he's looking at that bubble and then plant his right foot and throw the slant. But he ha you have to have that little pause, right? You cannot just like catch and throw here. So again, this is not really the screen, but that's what goes off the screen. So big place potential. Nobody's blocking. Now we're throwing the ball. Again, like when we, when we play a team that, you know, bubble or that number three receiver screen is a good thing, you know, that's when you want, like you're going to end up throwing it a lot. That's when that space normally is vacated. That's why you've liked to throw this the screen, you know, three, four times this game, that's going to be a nice time to, to take that space just from a different way and help those blocks the next time you call that hitch or that, that, uh, that screen. So I'm pretty sure this is a, one of the things that he goes maybe a bit too upfield, this number two receivers, but one thing he's conscious is to not move inside too much, right? So he's maybe also a bit fast. If we catch this ball like 10 yards off the fields, maybe the D, but um, like how we break tackle and make us make it really looks good. Show you a couple of things. So again, like we talked about pressure. I don't know if it's this clip or the next, but you know, um, obviously you, you want to bring pressure. This is a quick, you know, it's not a long pass protection and we're taking advantage of their aggressiveness coming towards the line of scrimmage. 
and there's a lot of space there inside. Same thing. So I'll show you a couple. So now instead of our same play as uh, the screen, so this is a, a screen instead of the receiver screen, tailback screen, but we're not releasing any O linemen yet. It's just that all three receivers now are going to become blocker and we're throwing the tailback. So it's as if the tailback becomes our most inside receiver. So same play as before, just the tailback is getting that, that ball now and everybody else is blocking. Same teaching the tail, the quarterback needs to have that little pause. And often if you play against ends that like to peel with the back, if he goes hard like this, we, we try to attack downhill at first, get to the quarterback's depth and then get outside. Same thing here with our tailback. Maybe not as downhill as I would like, but we get just outside and we just have three receivers trying to reach the outside shoulder. So again, just an extension of your running game, good against pressure, making landbacker blitzing, potentially redirect with your back. We're going to the field. We're stacking the receiver. So with this, you know, a lot of people will run this tailback hot and, and the quarterback draw, but same idea as the last play we had with the slant coming from the side where the, the screen come from. Now we're just going to read that landbacker, and if he chase, we're going to throw a slant from the place he vacates. And that's all what this is. So quarterback has – he's just looking at the mic. The mic wants to sprint with the back. We're going to use that space and throw the slant behind. Same thing, tailback is leaving, and we almost get, uh, get screwed here with um, – our, our quarterback is is looking here, but it's he gets confused because the Sam is blitzing. He's replacing him, so really we should be good to throw the tailback here. But we're we're lucky the wheel is still there, and we're throwing the back the the slant. Um, prefer to throw the back here, but can see how he got confused a little bit with that linebacker moving. Normally, um, you know, if you have a, a linebacker like this that moves with the back. Is because it's man, five man pressure, and where we have the, the middle of the field. I believe this is going to be the same thing where we have oh, one more clip. So we can do now the same thing from the front side. So the tailback is running, doesn't do a good job selling it. So he's running that that shoot like it's going to be a screen, but now the slant comes from the same side. So we fake block and we're coming in the middle of the field no matter what. So same concept that we had from the, like out of three receivers, now just with the back running that screen behind it. I don't know if I'm going too fast. Again, when we're running that, when you're throwing that slant, you, you need that pause a little bit uh, more from the quarterback. Um, that's not even a good example, but the, Normally that two-step, I don't know if I have some clips. No, I won't. But you want a bit more patience. So here we're going to have an inside zone look from our fullback. Crossing a quarterback's face. And what we've done is this tailback does the same thing. Step up to the quarterback's depth, then sprint to the sideline. And we've thrown this with blockers behind. And now we're just throwing the slant to number two. And again, with that back moving like this and all this action, you can see how him chasing create that big space that we're going to take advantage of. And like even in man, it's, this is man, like really hard for him. Like he, wa he wants to widen with this to keep contained and then he lose leverage on the slant. It's man, he sees the bubble, he, li he goes outside to leverage the, the screen by the back, but he loses leverage on his man in man-to-man -man coverage. All right. Any questions? Doing a good job. That's good. Hey, JP, I got a question for you. Yeah, shoot. Um, this is from a little while ago. I should have butted in earlier, but um, you were showing a, a wide receiver screen that was coming out of a sort of a, a flood change motion to quad. 
Yeah. And the the cut up you showed us, the defensive backs were, were taking that very seriously as a deep threat. I'm curious what that changed to quads, uh, what the other half of that play is that that makes sure that those guys are on their back heels yeah. into your screen. Um, what do you do so, with that one? Yeah, so it's a bit different. Maybe it's not uh, – um, give me one second. So it's not the end. So, like, we, we did play, like, uh, Coach Lapolis actually has some nice, like um, – thought like nice concept where I think he does it even to the boundary as well but like he has four people like this and looks like hitch and he's he's running like hitch and go type of thing you can see this screen right what I'm drawing yeah 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 and we we didn't do this as much but one thing that we did a lot of the quads and motioning out of quads is a very vertical concept that I'm not going to talk about but that looks and Stole this from a, a terrible coach at Ottawa U called Breezy. Saw it on film. And I think stole it from him and play with this. But we, we ran this play a lot. So it's like a, I don't know if you call that a four vertical concept and scissor concept. So against cover two looks, we, we high load the free safety, the strong free safety with like a, a post that can change the angle and the seam. So when teams shot us in quad, mostly in second and 10, I would say like we, have thrown this to death so people not playing low on us kind of made sense but again like we didn't go so much we didn't have that much of a to be honest of a, of a like hitch wheel I guess that's what you were maybe thinking about that you know maybe we should have but uh, it was maybe a little bit more of a, of a one-off and just took advantage that like it's just hard to have four low defenders on four receivers like you really want to bring your half across and keep him low as well uh, then you know, we didn't feel like we need the hitch wheel, but we can just run some vertical concept then. I just sure saw that, that those particular defensive backs at that particular moment were very concerned about the vertical. And I mean, obviously you're doing a screen presentation, so I knew the screen was coming, but man, they didn't. Um, yeah. So I figured, uh, I figured well, you'd thing... hit them with something that looked very similar with that sort of jump to quads. Yeah, well, one thing is uh, for sure. I think our like our answers to cover zeros to go vertical. Like we were always a vertical offense, so um, for, and that's what makes sense. We threw so much of those receiver screen, right? Like we uh, kind of stretched uh, the field and, and and made them defend third level and deep, and you know then took what they gave us, which was the underneath stuff. So obviously, if you get like press all across. You know, I'm not beating my head against the wall trying to throw, you know, receiver screen all day. I'll, I'll go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. cool. Thanks, JP. Uh, no problem. Um, I'm going to get into, like, it's still two receiver screens that have now involvement from the O-line. So, Coach Colson, at some point, if you want to jump in, let me know. Uh, on here, I'll start with the, with the receivers, what we're doing. So, um, we had some screens that uh, were – you know, outside this one week receiver here, it's a jailbreak screen. A lot of people would call, um, we're, we're going to run it right on the hash. So this receiver is going to end up running on the hash where, what I mean, the hash is where the ball was snapped. He will take one quick step and he's bubbling a little bit on our side of line of scrimmage. And he's going to catch this ball on the line of scrimmage. And, um, for the number two receiver, it's a little bit different. It's MDM, but you can see now that I'm not going towards the outside. He's now trying to build a wall here and protect. What we don't want him to do is chase a low corner and leave the half to go make the play while the corner slow play it here. So very different than the hitch outside that we show. He's going to come and actually set inside and see who's MDM. Is the half slow playing and he's chasing? He's going to block the corner or vice versa. I don't know. It's whole coverage. Obviously, he's going to block the half and try to start a wall here uh, to block everybody else outside. Our quarterback's going to have our normal uh, screen timing, same as for the tailback, where he's going one, two, three, and then fadeaway throw. Um, on the other side of the field, 
we try to get outside release from number three receivers and end up often blocking the free safety. And for the other two receivers, our normal rule would be post wheel. But we thought on this sometimes when we run down the field, those DBs kind of chase us down the field on post and wheels and they're rallying to a big play that stops at 30 yards instead of going all the way. So we show that little screen, but he's not an option. We're just trying to keep those defenders low and away from, you know, hopefully if it goes well, a deep play where this receiver is going to carry the ball for a while. For our offensive lineman, actually, I'll talk about the back. The back, he has to leave a little bit early, and he's going to join number two receiver in creating the wall, and he's blocking the wheel. He's, he's man up on the wheel. He's, he's going to try to seal the oh, – sorry, I shouldn't say that. You, he blocks the wheel 90% of the time because that's the area where he's trying to finish that wall off, right? So we're showing pass. We want to make room between the D linemen and the next defenders to, for this receivers to run up the funnel. Really, this play, a little bit of timing to teach with the receivers. Obviously, with the O-line, a little bit more work. And I'll, I'll give you a – I'll start here, Coach Colson. You want to correct or change anything or add anything, let me know. But basically, our, our two tackles are going to try to drive those ends as upfield as possible, and they're not releasing both sides. Our three middle alignment, or 1,001, 1,002, and release straight ahead and sprint down the field. From, you know, we, on every screen, you want the receivers to adjust to the O-line. So we don't want our O-line to start chasing people left and right on this. We'll want them to be, you know, two and a half yards apart, sprinting down this hash. Let the receiver be in a spot five yards behind where, you know, people have to come through those O-linemen to go get our, our receiver. If we're correct, this, this end gets a bit upfield. We're throwing the ball basically off the ear of this left tackle right on the line of scrimmage. That's where we would catch the ball. And when we talked about funnel, this receiver is sprinting behind those O-line. And one thing, if you start running this play that you'll notice is as he catch the ball and start being like five, six, ten yards down the field, he's going to see a lot of people converging to the hash. And this receiver with the ball is going to see a lot of green space out here. And he's going to catch, get in the funnel for a couple of steps, and run out of the funnel, and then get tackled for a 10-yard gain, 12-yard gain. We're teaching this receiver he can only get out of the funnel once he's physically ahead of the O-line. So 20, 25 yards on the field. If you pass the O-line, sure, now you can you know, go to green space, but not before you've physically be ahead of the O-line. Anything to add here, here, Coach Colson, before I jump to the film? No, I think that's pretty much it. From the O-line point of view, what's kind of nice is like, unlike most other screens where it's your funnel guys, your, your three O-linemen or two O-linemen, whatever, it's their job to go get in front of the receiver. Well, in this case, actually, they're just running their line down the hash two yards apart, and it's the receiver's job to get in the funnel. And, you know, you're right. You get used to the two things that happen a lot is the O-line to start chasing bodies. Like, don't do that. They're going to have to come to you. Stay on the hash. As long as the receiver gets in the funnel, they're going to have to come to you. And then, like you said, we're going to ask our O-lineman to sprint down the funnel or down the hash mark, which usually means at some point, if we do it right, the receiver will be pretty much walking behind them as the defenders come to them. So you got to teach the receiver, be patient, slow down. Those guys are a little bit slow maybe, but stay in there until we pick people off and it splits and then off you go. So yeah, that's it. Yeah. And, and one thing too, we've seen, I feel like is O-line at some point you run down the field for a while and then they look back. <laughs> it's like, Hey, you running until the whistle. Don't, uh, don't stop before that, that ref whistle. Uh, da -da -da -da. Uh, yeah. Well, I wanted to show you this uh, this rap OJ, but I don't have the film. I don't have all of our film, so I'm not. So, talk start talking with the receivers, and now I'll go with the wide even. Then, if you want to jump in when we go to the tight, uh, Coach Colson, go ahead. So I'll start with the wide. So this wide out um, over here, taking one step only, quick, 
and he's coming on our side on a scrimmage, bubbling a little bit so he can kind of get an angle back up to go up the funnel. And again, decent job to stay behind the O-line. Not tempted right now to bounce anything. He's passing offensive linemen and then going for space. To the number two receiver, great job to just understand like, hey, I need, I need to get inside of him and help create that funnel, that space for that receiver. You almost get beat too fast on the outside. It's just good enough. And from the back, you'll see it from the tight as well. One of the challenging things from the back sometimes is just to get out on time, right? Find your way out and then help creating that wall with that first color that, that shows. And that's, a, you know, just good enough for us to, uh, to get in the funnel. Get to the tight. And go ahead, Coach Colson, if you want. Okay, well, I mean, one of the things that does get tough about this play is you can see the uh, the play side tackle, our left tackle in this case. Your job is to clear that throwing lane, and that can get a little bit a little bit tough sometimes, depending on how the end plays you. So, we I've done it a few different ways. If you've got a guy that plays with some width, then he's coming downhill. Well, we've cut him before to get his hands down. But normally, what I teach is a short flat set, and then we're going to try to underset him a little bit, and then shot put him upfield and drive him deep and wide, and try to open that throwing lane off your inside ear. But one way or the other, I was telling you, you just can't let him stand there in the throwing lane and play volleyball. And then from there, now you see we got an odd front, so the, the center's covered, so he's going to plant his feet and get beat. But we should, hopefully, our three guys in the middle here, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, we're going to keep a little bit of good integrity running up the field. We're going to let people come to us. We're not going to stop and look back like our guard does here. And like JP said, just keep trucking down the field. Let people come to you. Pick them off as they come, and it's the ball carrier's job to get in there. Yeah, you can see for our left guard keeps coming, he ends up maybe on the free safety instead of turning back. So I, 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 oh, can you see this? You're good, Colson? It's very blurry. Yeah, this is the, the night. Can, yeah, you cannot see. I'm going to show a different clip. Better? <laughs> <laughs> so, one thing I didn't talk about on the on the previous clip is the quarterback it was not exactly what we're looking for. Again, here he's looking away, but he's a bit too fast. Like I told you guys, where we want to catch this ball should be one, two, three, and then throw. He's he's a little bit throwing that fast, so it's, uh, maybe I'm being picky. But to me, like we're still far from the funnel when we're throwing that. Maybe it's the angle actually. Now that I look at it. And so last thing before we get onto the O-line. So that's not bad, but like one of the things our receiver needs to get is like, as we know, we can block downfield if we catch the, like we can block downfield before we catch the ball, if we catch the ball on or behind the line of scrimmage, that's a screen. Well, sometimes on this, we need to, you know, stretch that, you know, on the line of scrimmage. So one that received because like you can just see the angle where coach Colson talked about how hard it is to get this end up field. If our receiver is still three yards in our backfield, you know, we, we keep that D, that DN in play. So we're, we're really close to like being past the line of scrimmage normally when we catch this ball. And that's why I feel like he's too far out here and the receivers could be a little bit, you know, in a better spot catching the ball right now, you know, behind our O-linemen and, um, closer to the funnel again like those big plays i like how our receivers stay in that funnel doesn't try to go to green space right now he's being patient and reading his block and just plowing forward jp Anything? quick question on that did did you guys mostly use uh like a returner that so he would set up those blocks better or what did you find with that yeah, like for sure, personnel always. Our number one week was often that guy. Um, so we didn't have, but yeah, like you, like I showed you, like with the number two receiver, like being a DB at times. But you know, for us, like it's uh, it kind of makes sense. Like with all the hitch that you we throw, this you know, he's that person that's not like say like the the six four two hundred fifteen pound guy, but you know, he's maybe the more like. Uh, shifty and can get yak uh, type of receiver as always so but yeah you want to be conscious of that for sure 
Anything to add here on this one, Coach Colson? Well, I would just uh, tag on a little bit to what you talked about. Talk about kind of trouble spots or things that can go wrong with this play. So getting the play side ends uh, hands down or getting him out of the throwing lane is one of the really important thing things. Uh, the other thing JP kind of touched on there, and I'd want to talk about both two things that have gone wrong a lot with this play. We've had the ball picked off by the will linebacker. You need to teach your quarterback not to stare at the jailbreak receiver as he's getting into his drop. We need to be able to look away somehow, not let the will get into that funnel lane before our tailback can actually get, get hands on him and kick him out and let us get into the jailbreak funnel. So that's one of the things you see our quarterback starting to look away at least. So we're not at least staring down one week and pulling the will right there. Uh, the other thing JP had talked about, and you don't want to make this mistake, is we don't want that receiver catching the ball two, three, four yards behind the line of scrimmage. Happened before, too. If you watch that big nose tackle there, that big fella in the zero technique, well, imagine us catching the ball about three yards deeper than we are right now. That's not a good deal for that jailbreak receiver. <laughs> Okay, we've had that happen before. So those guys kind of learn pretty quickly, like, listen, don't bubble too deep and be six yards behind a line of scrimmage when you catch this, because that's going to be a world of hurt. Thanks. I mean, like that, for your old line, this can be a fun play, though. Like, we sprint down that hash and pick up anybody that, that shows up. Like, I mean, that can, when they get the mentality of it, that can be uh, a lot of fun. Yeah. So just from the wide, you can see like the line of scrimmage is that 54 yard line. And we're catching that at the 53 and then we can even be a bit more deeper, like more like upfield. That's so you cannot be more in their backfield than this. I'll skip a couple, give me one, two. This one, I think. So we are the three, three empty. Uh, so maybe I should have shown the last one. Uh, anyways, so different look to run this. So now we are the three, three empty. So the only difference is I line up my back at three week and he has the same responsibility help with the, the wall to get into the funnel, right? So he knows this receiver is, is he, he is our tailback. So he does exactly the same thing, knows he needs to come and, and fix the funnel and same play for everybody else. But, but just a different look. Again, the, all the clips that I picked, I guess, were against an odd front. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I didn't see it from the wide, but like we're, we're pretty far and flat. Like our quarterback needs to throw this over that end to get to a receiver. And often, I'll, I'll, I'll be fair, this receiver... In my opinion, not that he would say that, he does not like this part of the field. And I find sometimes when you're teaching this, it's like, get going, get in here, because staying out here is not going to help you out. Being deep in a backfield is not going to help you out. But they kind of tentative and want to like slowly get there. It's like, we should be catching the ball, you know, right here. And you can see that that would help, or maybe right here, that would help our or throwing lane. Anything else on this one, Coach Colson? No, I don't think so. Again, we're pretty decent job of keeping the integrity of our funnel as we release down the field. That's uh, pretty good setup by our center there to start to get a little bit of pass rush and then give him a little bear paw on the way by on the zero technique. We always want to release him away from the screen side if we can. So we're going to set a little, in this case, to our left, hoping to invite him to our right, you know, away from where the screen's being drawn. That's something pretty typical on most screens. I'll go back if I can one play this one. So that the last clip I want to show is just a different look again where I believe it's the when the, we're motioning, but the back. Yeah, the, so we're going 4-2 with the back. So it, think about three two when we lost our uh, our tail back, and we need, so we can only do this. This is uh, Greg Marshall's defense, and you know he's going to line up a hat in front of every eligible. So you can count on this weak half back. Yeah. 
weekend, right? There we go. So you, you have to count on this weak halfback to not be here, right? If you're playing a team that maybe he stays, then you don't want to do this. But if you know he's going to he's gonna come across and put a hat in front of every eligible, then we've just got a different look to run the same play because the wheel is going to come in front of the back and we'll get the same picture again. That's a bit better from our quarterback taking his time and in, in the the spot where we're catching this ball, I think. Where was the yeah. center? Yeah, because we're not in the middle of the field, right? So we're just outside the queue. That's yeah. a decent spot. Actually, one of the things that I'd point out here too, JP, if you go back on the tight copy. So now we've got a, an even front. And uh, so again, both guards now are covered. And they're going to try to release the three tech and the one tech away from the screen side, which works out pretty well here because they're already shaded away from it. That's great. Uh, if you look at our boundary uh, guard, and this is one of the things that you you get used to after a while and you catch on film, we're hoping to get that one tech upfield here. Yeah, sorry, our right guard in this case. We're hoping to get that one tech upfield. And he's trying to, you know, invite him upfield and give him that big bear paw. He misses with the bear paw, but he feels that that one tech is retracing his steps. So if you feel like the guy's stuck to you like a fridge magnet, we won't go join the funnel. We'll try to stay right there and block him so he can't retrace his steps. So that takes a little bit of practice. But basically, as an old lineman, you teach him, like, if you miss, if you invite the guy and he doesn't go, all right, well, listen now, our biggest job is to make sure he can't take two steps backwards and make the play on the receiver trying to get into the funnel. So our, our guard does a pretty decent job of feeling that out and going, okay, I'm just going to stick on the one tech here. The last thing I want to show you before we go into just a normal tailback screen. We only have uh, two. I have two clips. I think this is an incomplete pass. I could only find two clips. So this is in between. So now we're, we're going to have a snap screen where we're going to try to create some movement away from the screen and have the receiver, same idea with the receiver trying to create a wall here. We're going to take three, bubble back, but now the aiming point is just inside uh, the numbers where the O-line will come to us. So a little bit of a, ah, a little bit of a different look. This one is dropped by the receiver, but you can see how that would look. So our tailback is running inside zone towards the left to the field. Move some people, move the Mike Lane backers towards the field, and we're throwing the receiver. We can talk about the O-line from the tight, but you can see how this O-lineman is releasing flat and then gaining, gaining depth, and we would want to get right behind him and up just inside the numbers. Oh. So... Over here, so very different screen. You want to go ahead and talk. Actually, you want me to go back to the slide, Poston, if you want to talk about it, or you want to teach here? No, that's fine. We can, we can talk about this. Let it run there, JP. Hmm. <laughs> no, you can't. So in this one now, we're releasing our play side tackle and play side guard is who we're looking to release. And normally the way that we would do it, our, bound, uh, our right tackle here, uh, our boundary tackle, he's going to release. And what we would say now is between uh, the slot back and that boundary tackle, you guys have got to block the corner and the half. And what we would do is put the slot back on the low player and tell that tackle releasing, he's got to go try to find the high player. One of the things that we talked about, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more too when we talk about tailback screen, is that idea of when that tackle releases, we actually want him to come a little bit flat down the line of scrimmage. Now, not so flat that he's going to run into the receiver who's running the snap screen back into him. But if he runs straight up the field, what happens a lot of the times is he, he loses leverage on the defender that he's going to end up blocking. OK, so we want to get him just a little bit flat just to get him out there, basically, to get enough width. Then what we would do is we would release the guard. And normally we'd run this with some kind of play action or influence to the field. So like a zone strong type play. And we want to release the guard and try to get him uh, to block the will. So we did it this time with the center, but we're going to release and try to get them to wall off the play side linebacker. Again, this is a little bit different because there's only going to be one 
receiver, but again, you, you need to know that the half is not going to be there. It was the same idea. And now you're really counting on your boundary tackle to go get that, that only defender left to that side. There's nobody else that can block him. So for a receiver, again, it's quick three, bubble back. He's trying to get in inside the number. And we have some kind of action away from it. So over here, we have a, a right guard pulling. A fake mesh turning around and throwing the screen. Yeah, and so you can see here we're, we're faking a long trap play to the field, hoping to influence the uh, weak side linebacker. And we do that, right? They do a good job of following their pullers. That's their job. So now we're just going to get the tackle to slip the end and get out. And really, it's like we talk about a lot with the big old lineman blocking out in space. Like, listen, you don't need to be a great open field blocker. You need to find your line, create that wall, and let the ball carrier get behind you. Okay. Then tell back screen. So I'll go to the uh, go to a slide if you want to. Sorry. Bunch of tail back screens, full back screens. Here we go. You want to talk about this, Coach Coase? Is that good enough? Or you want me to go right to the film or? No, that's okay. I'll talk about this a little bit. I'll actually, uh, uh, if I can, present my, my whiteboard after this and just oh. kind of talk about a couple of things. If I, I don't know if I'm able to do that or. Yeah. You want to share now? I can let you share your screen. Well, thanks for letting me do that. That'd be great. Now? So, sure. Yeah, sure. We can do it now. Whatever you think. Let's hope this works. You're being brave, JP. Have you got your cell phone ready if you've got to become the audio for him again? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was funny. Made it work somehow. I was I was laughing at it tonight because oh. like I when I when I first logged in, it was cutting out all the time. I my like I never had any issue here, even during the day working from home or anything like that. And obviously when you're just about to present your internet is not working, I was like, Great. I'm gonna pull a course in tonight. Well, apparently this is in keeping with form. I can't share my screen. So why don't you go back to I don't know what's going on. It's something that this is my wife's computer so i'll blame her for this so jp you want to go back to showing the uh just the insert slide yeah trying to get the optimized video again but um... all right Uh, okay, so this is what we're looking at here is kind of your classic tailback off tackle screen. So for most of us, probably when you think of a screenplay, this is kind of the one that, that we think about. And, uh, you know, what we're going to do on this play is we're going to sell pass. We're going to sell a five step. We're going to get our tailback. You can see him here to step up, settle for a second. He's going to release to the catch point. And I'll kind of talk later on about the catch point, where that is and stuff. We're going to release three offensive linemen. Now, I know these lines look crazy. I'll explain those in a second. But we're going to just release the interior three. So I just end up calling them Huey, Dewey, and Louie. Okay, your center and your two guards. We're going to release those guys to go get in front of the catch point and block for the, the tailback down, downfield. Okay. I, I would start, you know, if we were talking to the guys about this, I would talk about the, the kind of concept of the play. It's pretty simple, but it's funny how much it comes back when the play doesn't work and you can review the basic concept of the play. It's a tailback screen. Okay. Our whole goal here is we want to get the pass rushers running at the quarterback and the pass defenders trying to cover receivers and then throw the ball in the void between the two of them. So if we can get, if it's just a four man pressure, those four D linemen running at the launch point and the will and the mic and the half and everybody else running back to cover somebody, then we got a chance to throw the ball in the void with blockers in front. Um, the two parts to that, that whole idea of, of uh, you know, getting the pass rushers going to the quarterback. Well, if you've ever done it as an offensive lineman, there's a bit of an art to it. 
It's not as easy sometimes as it sounds, okay? Those D linemen, a lot of times it's crazy to think about, but they're actually smarter than they look. So we can't just stand up some of the time to get out of the way and let them run to the quarterback. They'll figure it out. So you got to find a way or a technique to be able to sell pass, to make the, get those guys into their best pass rush move, and to be able to get them going towards the quarterback without getting yourself as an offensive lineman out of position. What happens a lot of times is you're too deep. You set somebody too deep into the backfield, and now you're that much further away from the funnel, you know, getting out there to, to the catch point and being able to block for the tailback. Uh, so, you know, my basic uh, uh, way to teach it that I would always talk about is we're going to try to release any first level player that's over us if we're covered away from the screen side. So in this case, both guards are covered. We're going to try to release the three tech and the one tech to the field because we're throwing the screen to the boundary. And what I would tell the guys is plant your feet and get beat. OK, so on the snap of the ball, we show a high hat. I get my hands up just like I'm getting into a pass set. I take my pass set, but then I plant my feet. And I let the D lineman beat me with whatever move he's going to use. And on the way by, if I can give him the bear paw, that big paw in the back or a little shot in the hip to get him moving a little further, great. Okay, but that's what we're trying to do. So there is a bit of an art to it. And uh, like I said, one of the things that does happen with this is you'll get one of those covered guards. They want to they want to sell pass, but they end up taking a set that's so, so deep. They end up three yards in our backfield and then they try to release and go get to the funnel. Okay, so that's a bit of an issue. Um, the other part to that, the kind of the concept of the play is getting the pass defenders, getting the cover guys to go do their job, go cover people. And, uh, you know, that all has to do with the box guys with the mic and the wheel. Let's say it starts with this. It starts with, look, we need to make this thing look like a pass, like a five step, obviously not like a screenplay. Your tailback's got to have a little bit of patience here. So he's got to step up in this case to the left of the quarterback and kind of settle his feet and make it look like he's going through whatever his scan pro is. If he's got the will, make it look like he's looking for the will, and then he's looking for a half. He's got to have a little bit of patience to sell it. Uh, one thing I'll talk about later is when we're talking about pressure or man coverage, for sure that changes the dynamics a little bit. But really, if we're just starting with a four-man rush and we want to teach it against zone coverage, well, look, get up there and make this thing look like we're throwing a five-step. Uh, one of the things that's helped this screen a little bit is the way that uh, uh, defenses have developed and progressed over the years in terms of zone coverage, even teams playing cut and hold and stuff. Everybody reads routes now. There's not many people that still teach a spot drop. There still are some, but they're now, as soon as they read high hat, you know, they want to read two to one or three to two to one or back to two to one. And they want to look up overs and stuff like that. So one of the things that we did start to do to help influence these guys a little bit is run some routes. So I think we got post wheel over there to the boundary JP, but yep. we started doing some things that were, we'd take the slot back or we'd take one week, let's say, and run them on what looks like an over just to capture the wheels eyes and then pivot them back out and pull them wider. Anything that buys us more time in order to be able to get those guys deeper, wider, and then get the right orientation between our funnel blockers and our, our tailback. So those kind of two things I would start by talking about, like get the pass rushers going. There's an art to it. Get the cover guys to drop and go do their job. Go look up routes and try to cover receivers. As far as uh, where the screen is caught, this is now uh, where the catch point is and the relationship between those three funnel blockers. Okay, your, your three offensive linemen that are releasing and the tailback. This becomes the part to me that's, that's the most important part. So we would set the catch point for the tailback somewhere about two to four yards outside of the offensive tackle of the tackle box, basically. And as much as when we teach receivers, sometimes you can be pretty exact. You know, this is a, a seven yard stop. It's not six. It's not eight. This one, it's not as easy to be exact because you don't know exactly how much shit the tailback's going to have to fight through before he gets out there. OK, so we would say approximately two to four yards. And that's now the catch point that the funnel, the three offensive linemen have to get to. Okay, They have to have the right width and we have to have the right relationship between the funnel and the tailback. And in my experience, this is one of the first places where the, the play kind of falls down, where you really need to do some coaching. So two things that will happen a lot of times, you'll get the tailback, he'll release, and he'll release when the O-lineman release. I'll talk about that in a bit. He'll release, get underneath that quick who's upfield, and end up running a flat route. You know, he ends up running all the way to the sidelines like he's running a shoot. And now you got to talk to the kids, say, hey, listen, you know those three O linemen that you're already in front of? You run a four-six, they don't. 
you if you want them to be in front of you blocking, you're going to have to slow down a little bit. You're going to have to stop at the catch point to let us get out in front of you so we can block. So that's one of the first places where you lose the funnel relationship. Tell the tailback, get to the catch point and stop and let the old lineman get out in front of them. The other issue that'll happen is when the O-linemen release, and I'll talk in a second about who sets the funnel and who's in charge of this, but the O-linemen release, they can't release straight up the hash. This is one of the things that happens too. Your O-linemen will plant their feet and get beat and sell screen, and now they want to go run and block somebody, and they just run straight ahead, right down the hash, as though we're running that jailbreak screen that we showed. And now you have to teach them, no, that's not where the catch point is. So we've got to get them out to the catch point. So I spent a lot of time talking to my guys, as simple as it is, look, guys, this is football. We need the blockers in front of the ball carrier. That's pretty true on the vast majority of things you're going to do in football. So we're going to spend a lot of time making sure on this play that the blockers are in front of the ball carrier. And, uh, you know, we've we've chalked it, we've shown film, we've walked it. But like a lot of things in my experience, the, the best way to get that is just repetition. Just do it over and over again. Start by just doing it on air and making sure we're catching the ball and releasing to the funnel in that same spot so we're getting the blockers in front of the, uh, the tailback. Um, okay, so from there, I guess I'd go back to uh, release timing. And the way we did it um, is, is we would have the O-lineman release and the tailback goes when they go. So if you can picture this, and we'll see film in a second, on the snap of the ball, the tailback steps up, in this case, to the boundary side, to the left of the quarterback. He's going to settle his feet. And what he's going to do is kind of snuggle up behind that, that boundary guard. He's going to, like, not right up his arse, but he's going to get a little close to him. The boundary guard is trying to release the nose into the A-gap inside, and then we'll take our B-gap release when the guard goes or when the three interior offensive linemen go. So if you teach the tailback, you don't go till the O-line goes. You got a much better chance that the tailback is going to be behind the offensive lineman when they get out to the screen to go block for them. Now, there are some caveats in there. If you get a big pressure situation and the tailback recognizes that he's going to have to present himself earlier. He can't hang in there all day if there's some kind of seven-man pressure coming or something like that because the quarterback's got to have an option to get rid of the ball. But everything being equal, you know, three, four, even five-man rush, hey, listen, Get up there. When they go, you go and you're good. Uh, the way we would teach the three offensive linemen, uh, we would teach this. Our base rule was this. The first uncovered interior offensive lineman to the screen side is going to lead the funnel. So in this case, uh, we've got a, an even front. We've got a 40 front. So the center is our uncovered offensive lineman. He's the one that goes. He's the one that goes first, and everybody reacts off of him. If we had a 30 front, let's say, where the boundary guard was the first, uh, the guy uncovered, well, then he's going to be the one that goes first. So if you make it the uncovered offensive lineman is the one who leads the screen, you got a much higher percentage chance that he's going to get out there. You're going to have at least one guy there as opposed to waiting for someone who's covered. Now, if it's a 50 front or a double eagle or something, our rule would just be make it the play side guard and you got to make sure you know when to get out there. So we would say in this case, the center, because he's uncovered, he's going to lead the funnel. And the timing of it is something that we played around with a lot. And uh, here's the thing. It's like you would teach a count. Everybody kind of teaches a count. And I would too. I kind of ended up being, you know, thousand, one thousand go. And that was the timing that kind of worked. But the count's on the center. And when the center goes, both guards go. And when they go, the tailback goes. So now you don't get guys counting at different rates of speed and stuff like that. Look, when the center goes, we all go because he's uncovered in this case. Okay, so the center is the first guy to the funnel. And if you can see this line here for the center, he's got a pretty flat line. He's the kickout guy. So this is the first thing that I would teach him about getting to the funnel. There always, or there should be anyways, against any sound defense, any sound defense, the first thing they're going to try to do is leverage this screen, turn it back inside. Somebody is going to be out there trying to come down and outside of that screen and turn it back in. So we want the first releaser, the center in this case, to be flat down the line of scrimmage, and he's looking to kick out the first thing that leverages the funnel, Could you know, usually the half. But whoever the first defensive player you know, in the, in, of the DBs, the cover guys that have recognized the screen, they're going to be taught to come down and outside, turn it back inside. So whether it's the half, the corner, the free, maybe the will's taking a deep wide drop and he's coming down. The first thing that shows up outside of the funnel, kick it out. 
if nothing shows up, we would give them like a landmark to get to. If you get out towards the numbers and nothing shows up, then sure, turn it upfield and be another funnel blocker. But for the most part against good defenses, someone's going to come down and leverage that screen. Uh, our second releaser now in this case is going to be our boundary guard. Okay, so our left guard. So when the center goes, he goes with him. He's going to get in the hip pocket of the center. And when the center gets to the funnel point, to the kickout point, he's now going to wheel it upfield. He's the lead blocker looking for the next high player, next high color that's coming down to the screen. So hopefully what we've done is kicked out the leverage player and created an alley for the tailback to be able to run the ball up into. So we got a kick out guy and then we got a wheel guy, the second releaser, the boundary guard in this case, looking for a high defender coming down. Uh, the third guy. So this is going to be the, the offside guard. Okay. Or the backside guard. So in this case, our field guard, he's the rat killer. So what he's going to do now when the center releases, he's going to release, he's going to get leverage on the, the box, basically what we would tell him to do, start following your guard and your, sorry, your center and your guard as you were. But once you get leverage on the box, you get outside, turn back inside and look for one of the defensive linemen retracing their steps. Okay. So he's, we call him the rat killer because we want him to peel back or the peel blocker. We want him to peel back and pick off anybody who's trying to run down the screen from behind. The reality is you catch that screen sometimes. And like, like we talked about with the receiver and the jailbreak screen, that tailback might have to slow down a little bit. The catch might not be great. You don't know sometimes as much as we'd love to have a great throwing lane for the tailback. Sometimes he's hidden behind the quick. He has to slide a little left, slide a little right. So it's not going to be thrown like a quick out that we can just turn up field. So that gives the defense a chance to retrace their steps. Well, this insulates us against that a little bit. So he's the peel guy or the rat killer coming back. So that's kind of the way. We do. And both tackles, your job is to just underset the defensive ends and get them upfield. And we get a little bit the same thing with the boundary tackle, the play side tackle. Your job is to get that quick out of the throwing lane and get his hands down. If all of us, you know, if we get him upfield and we can turn and swat him by, awesome. That's great. If all of a sudden he stops his feet and he wants to play a, be a volleyball player, well, listen, we got to plant him under the chin or if he engages with us and gets up now, we got to get down and get into his legs. We got to do whatever we need to do to get his hands out of the throwing lane. Okay, so and from there now, hopefully we got a kick out, we got a wheel and a peel, and our back's job is to just, much like we talked about with jailbreak, get into that funnel and, you know, use your blockers, set up your blockers. That same thing I talked about in the snap screen. We can't expect those 300 pounders to be great open field blockers, but they can look great if you've got a ball carrier who knows how to get in behind them and set up and use them. So that's kind of the, the I don't know, the basis of the screen. Uh, in terms of, of how we do it. I don't know. That makes sense, guys. Any questions or anything? I think you did a great job explaining it, Chris. For sure. well, hopefully something there made sense. So I think we got a few clips here, JP, if you want to run them, we'll see what we got here. Um, let me know, too, if the film is very blurry. I'll try to – I don't think I got the uh... – whatever it's called there to make it good and clear so far. So actually just pause it there, JP. So this would be, if you look at, this is us against Waterloo now, they're in an odd front, they're playing a 30 front. So by our rules now, it should be the boundary guard is going to lead the funnel. He's the first uncovered offensive lineman to the play side and he should be coming nice and flat and looking to kick out. And he does it. I think if, if I remember, he does a decent job on this one here. Okay, so I'm just going to you need to pause it just after we release JP. So you can see now in this case, now the Will linebacker here, if you can see my point, pointer, he's expanded wide, but he's now the one coming back downhill and looking to leverage the screen. So when I drew that, when we drew that line and we talked about the first funnel releaser coming flat down the line of scrimmage, we get a decent job here. That's a very important coaching point. Here's what these guys will want to do all the time. It's just human nature. They want to run up field. They want to run to this player. And then the player just runs downhill. And we're not good enough athletes to change direction. He runs downhill outside of him, gets back inside and plays the screen. So we have to, they have to have the discipline when you release, release flat, release on a flat angle. He's going to have to come to you if he wants to leverage it. 
So it's a good job, pretty good job here of our boundary guard releasing flat down the line of scrimmage. And there's the leverage player and just kick his ass out and get a wheel up in behind it. We should get a shot here. We're lucky we got a plus shaded nose here, nose here, so that helps us out a little bit. You can see what happens, though, guys. So if we go back to the nose on the center, so the center now is going to end up being the wheel guy. Now, we want to release that nose, you know, to the, the field side, away from the screen side. And that's always our rule if we can. But there does become a point where, like, look, coach, I tried to set him so as he would go to the field side, the strong side, and he didn't. He's determined across my face. Well, okay, listen. Turn, get him upfield, whatever you got to do so he's out of the lane. If we got to grab him and throw him, chuck him, whatever it is, you know, at some point you don't sit there all day fighting on the line of scrimmage trying to get the right release and then not end up getting to the funnel. So pretty decent adjustment here out of our center. Okay, if we look at our field guard now, he's going to be the rat killer. Okay, he doesn't, I think this is the one, he doesn't quite get enough leverage. So he's going to want to get leverage outside of the box and then once the screen is caught, turn back in and see who he can pick off. And I know, JP, if you can go back to the wide of it, you get a little bit of a shot of, of kind of what happens. Yep. It's, it's decent here. Okay, so if you can see our field guard from here, okay, our right guard, plant oh. his feet. Yeah, he just, oh, did you lose it? Yeah. It is That's something like you. On, oh, I got it. Yes. So you get a decent shot of it from wide here, if we can see it. So our field guard is just going to set in space. He's uncovered, so he's going to set in space. Now he's got to run out here, try to leverage the screen. He turns back a little bit early and look to pick something off. Now he misses one, and then I think he misses two as well. And, you know, you kind of like that thought of the whole, the big knockout shot. And we've had a few on them, although some people would argue you're blocking back towards your own goal line and some kind of penalty or something like that. But I don't know anything about that. But I know that in the end, even this is effective. Anything we're going to do to slow those guys down that are trying to chase down the funnel from behind. Okay, so here's one against the, an even front, against a, a 40 front. So this should be our center releasing now, and he's going to be the kickout guy. So you can see on the wide, this is a pretty decent job. Now our center is going to release, and there ends up being no one there to, le to leverage the screen. Looks like they got a little trap coverage or something here, and they're going to follow us across. So at some point, if there's no one there to leverage the screen, hey, we're able to use some receiver stuff to dick them around and get bodies out of there. Well, now we're going to turn up and start going north. Now we lost a funnel player here. You can see this ends up being a one-man funnel. But again, go back to if you make it the uncovered guy, you're almost always assured to at least get one person out there if shit's hitting the fan in the box. So I think you're going to see here something that we kind of uh, taught our center here. And uh, we need him to get out clean. So I don't know what everybody's got different kind of protections and stuff like that. But he does a pretty decent job here. I would tell the center in this, you're the uncovered player. I actually want you on the snap, snap of the ball, show a high hat but I want you to slide forward and get skinny. Don't put a hand on the near technique. Don't put a hand on the one tech. Don't do anything that makes him think he's being double teamed. He's going to stop his feet. He's going to try just slide forward, get skinny and let him let that one technique get through. And then that ensures that we're going to have a clean release. So we're going to ask these guys to actually get a little skinny on this and avoid a little bit so they can go through and get out. Now, you can see here, this is a little bit of a tougher one, and we didn't do a great job here. Now, in this case, both defensive tackles are actually shaded towards the screen side. Okay, That makes life a little bit, a little bit tougher. We want both guards to, to overset them to the screen side and still try to invite them away. So we want to, if we looked at our, yeah, there you go. If we looked at him, we want him to take a wider set. I mean, at some point, if I can keep setting that guy wide into the B gap and he's just going to keep going all day, well, life's probably pretty easy from a pass protection point of view, but it's that same thing. If you can't, okay, sell it. Like I would tell him, get out there. But if you can't, well, then at some point you need to get him going off upfield. You need to turn and you need to go join the funnel. So our guard wasn't able to get off here. Okay, you can see our backside guard now trying to leverage the screen, looking back for anything he can pick off. And this time he gets a pretty solid piece of somebody here. 
Okay. As far as the, our tailback does a pretty good job of getting through. So as far as the, the catch point and our kind of our, our biomechanics, our body orientation for the tailback getting to the catch point, uh, I know that I can for sure something that I've screwed up and, and done a lot is, is I've overcoached that. I've made it too complicated. I talked a lot at one point in time about exactly where that ball should be placed on our outside shoulder and turn up field and tuck the ball back to the quarterback and all of those things that kind of make a lot of sense. And it just got to the point where there were, you know, at some point I came back and simplified it when I was like, okay, listen, when the old linemen go, you go run out to the catch point, turn and catch the ball. So we would like to be able to catch that ball in a situation where we're able to turn our shoulders upfield naturally, but really it gets kind of ugly in there sometimes as, trying, as far as trying to avoid bodies. And you can see now our tailback hoping to get a B gap release. He's not sure if he will. He's able to squeeze through there against a three technique. Sometimes he's going to have to take an A gap release. If that's where the guard goes, that's fine too. Get out to the catch point, turn and catch the ball. The only uh, thing that we tried to avoid, and I would talk to the tailback here is, get to the catch point before you turn. Now he's a little off kilter there. He did a good job of squeezing through, but we would tell him don't back pedal out to the catch point. That's about the only thing that I ended up kind of harping on a lot. Get to the catch point, turn, catch the ball. One more maybe. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Actually one sec. That's crazy. Yeah. Stuff. All right. Maybe that's it. <laughs> okay. Well, that's all right. It's pretty, it's not the most complicated play in the world, but yeah. All right. I don't know. Any questions about any of that stuff? Thanks, Chris. That's what I had. I, I, I felt like when we talked about pressure and screen, I don't know, Rick, uh, like you mentioned at the beginning, we didn't talk like, you know, just tell, because like, even in this power, I don't know if you saw the PowerPoint, like we would have what this screen that we just talked about was nice because we were able to do it a bunch of different ways with motions, with a play action back to the tailback, to the tailback caught and our fullback would run that same screen. But like the O-lineman and the quarterback really did all the same thing over and over again, right? So it's one play that became for us, I don't know, six, seven plays. And like, obviously the most time we caught it was just a tailback like this like we showed or like a five hour set with motion and you saw the one with western like you have receivers crossing the formation tracking the eyes of those landbackers somehow and getting more time for those o-line to to get up and, and get in their face um but in all those screens like i find like you know when you tally up like we would finish like you know, six in the country in passing yards, and then you tally up how many we got on receiver screen or tailback screen, you realize, yeah, we we had a quarterback that, uh, you know, looked good maybe in stats. <laughs> I don't know how to say that politely. But, you know, you know, have a first-year quarterback, and, and all this stuff is helping out a lot. He's throwing the ball literally not past the line of scrimmage on the last hour and a bit that we've talked, right? So outside of the little slant right in the middle of the field. So, like, it's the shortest throw you can, you can have. So, um, and, and pretty consistent. So like, to me, like that idea of like extending your running game, getting away from pressure. And like, we started to see like, sometimes even I remember in one spring camp, we uh, started to see our defense is running all kind of, it's spring camp. Like it's May, like we, our, our players don't even know what's happening. They don't even know our plays yet. And it's, uh, then we're seeing all that movement, pressure, and all of a sudden, we're just, just here, 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 here. And we're, we're not throwing the ball. And I remember whenever the DC back after a spring camp, I was like, you're not planning on running the ball? Oh, we did a little bit, but I mean, you know, five, six-man pressure with slant all over. It's just it's a little bit easier to practice our screen day. So. Yeah. One thing I'd, I'd put in, too, is uh... – you know, if you're a coach and you're trying to insert it or install, and I guess it depends maybe on what your team's like or what level that, that you're at, but uh, I ended up learning this one a long time ago from Coach Gibson, actually, who's not on here, but he's like, he, he talked to me one time, like, listen, if screens don't work in practice, don't worry about it. 
there's always some scout team D lineman in practice who's just sitting there like a turd, who's not going to pass rush. And then all of a sudden it's like, holy fuck, look what I found. And he made a play on a screen, right? And I usually try to talk to those guys. Like, I'm pretty sure your D line coach isn't saying your job is to make the play on screen, but that can get frustrating after a while for your players and for coaches too. Cause you're like, holy fuck, like we never have any success with this screen, have faith in it, work through that stuff. It'll, it'll work. Yeah, we, we had more than double, I would say, the success of, on screen in games than in practice. Like even even DBs, like, you know, you go into a session where you want to practice a lot of those receiver screens. Well, now, like, they're playing hold, but the corner is six yard off. You're like, is that is that where you normally line up? You know, like they're, you know, so for sure they I find like, you know, they they work out a lot better in the games, but you need to practice them though, so. You're not suggesting defensive coaches cheat, do you? I don't. Most of the time, it was not the coaches. I would say most of the time, I've, I've coached with some. Uh, th- I've had some experience with some defensive coaches that were doing a hitch drill and they want to press us, which was interesting. But I would say that's the exception. Most of the times, the players that you know are just looking. Hey, it's human nature. Nature try to make plays, right? So you need the coaches to be like, hey, play it honest. Play like you would play it on second and ten when we're, you know, in the fourth quarter, up by two. No, and then try to make the play on the screen. JP, I think that uh, that stuff's good, right? I think way back in the early season when we were chatting about this, Jeff, for some of the stuff you were talking about, right? When you see a lot of pressure at junior football, a lot of those throws you showed us tonight are, like you said, they're not very far, right? It's it's not complicated, but then you also had a couple other plays that if teams are going to creep up, then you do have that inside slant or, <clears throat> you know, the play that Gabe talked about, right? You can run some verticals and still – you know, it, it's a nice complimentary play, right? Uh, going back to what uh, Chris showed us way earlier in the year there. So, Yeah, and it really spreads the ball around uh, with that kind of short game, uh, kind of an extension of the run game with everything nice and close to the line of scrimmage. You know, you, you got that, again, first-year quarterback that doesn't have, you know, the arm strength to the, to, for the verticals. So it gives some options for sure. Yeah, I'm one of those defensive coaches. We always knew too that if you know you're getting a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure, there'd be that point when you're on the sidelines, you be prepared for the screen. If they don't screen us sooner or later, like we're a, we're going to beat them by 50 here, but they need to start running the screen because you guys are getting in the backfield every play, and you know, boom, then you would see that play or that screen on the very next series, right? So, absolutely, and even in practice, I find I've lived that. Like we you know, in training camp or in spring camp where, like, your DC likes to call, you know, whatever he wants. All of a sudden, there's a lot of pressure and you start calling some screens. And then, you know, like, you, I find, like, we were able to play that game even in practice to see that. And then all of a sudden, you see less pressure next practice. And all of a sudden, inside zone looks a lot better uh, that it's not a game and a six-man pressure every second play. So. Uh, question, Coach Colson. Uh, your play side tackle on that tailback screen, uh, even on the other screens where he doesn't release, um, talk about how you would, would you ask him to maybe take a slow pass set and kind of fall like, like a, not a good pass set that he wouldn't normally just to invite the guy, like feel like he's beating the tackle up the field and then chase him and almost like lag behind on purpose. Yeah, that's, Coach, that's exactly it. That's what, what we try to teach. So other than seeing something on film that makes it different, what I would talk to him about is, one, I'd want a pretty flat set because I want to be able – I don't want to take a deep set, like a, a vertical set or anything like that, because I want to be able to, hey, if he stops, I need to be able to engage him and get his hands down. So I would start with a flat under set, so short set him. So give him that outside and let him throw his big rip or whatever he wants to do. And now we just want to turn and see if we can drive him deep and wide. But yeah, that's that's for sure one of the tricks to kind of get him out of the throwing lane a little bit, short and flat. I see where the flat would widen them. The yeah. So, might widen if you're going, it's for sure, don't allow the inside move when you go flat. But yeah. 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 And so that's, I, I found that, uh, you know, that kind of, just having that kind of set helped a lot to widen that B gap throwing lane. I see that. Thank you. Well, that was awesome, guys. I'm going to sign us out from the YouTube Live. Uh, for those of you watching YouTube Live, thanks for joining.